Thank you, everybody, for coming in. I think we can start. Um, it says uh, 10 minutes past 4, and the session starts 15 past 4. So I have five minutes to introduce <laughs> the session. So my name is Jaak Willer, and I welcome everybody to our data science seminar. Uh, this time, ah, I got my slides. Can I, can I switch them with this? Before we go to the, today's topic, I wanted to give you a little bit of uh, history of data science seminars. That we started seven years ago, uh, seven years and one week from now, uh, we started the seminar series. And in the first year, we did the first session was machine learning on 23rd of November, 2016. Then in January, uh, we did business data, health data, and deep learning. Deep learning seven years ago. So this is not the chat GPT kind of, wow, deep learning exists. But this was seven years ago. Uh, so it has happened 31 times already, uh, different events that we have uh, organized under this data science seminar umbrella. Um, and if I say that on average, 100 people, uh, this seminar is a little bit below average, but it means 2,500, uh, 3,000 people have attended these seminars over those years. And the last row says that since it's 32nd time, it's 2 to the 5, so it's 100,000th time in binary. Wow! Um, and today's uh, topic will be on smart, sustainable mobility and communities. This is a photo that I made one morning and decided to walk rather than pick one of those um, fancy scooters. We will touch some scooter data as well today. Maybe. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. Um, and the, the next photo I stole today from Facebook, which says that spring is coming. See, there is some green already uh, growing out from the snow. Um, so this may also lay some ground for how to be smart and sustainable in mobility. So uh, thank you, Mick Weinig. He doesn't know that I took it from his Facebook, but it was open in there. Um, and uh, we have, I will uh, finish my introduction um, because I, will I want to give over to Amnir Hadachi, who will be, who put together the program, who is the program manager for today. And there are one, two, three, four, five distinguished speakers. Um, what I wanted to point out that Amnir and Tavi, they're both presenting in the first data science seminar seven years and one week ago. Uh, Tavi has changed companies, uh, I guess, a couple of times. Um, and Am Amnir is in here. Uh, there is also this tendency that uh, academia is, is relatively uh, stable. I would not say slow, because academia is not slow, but it's stable. And companies are fast-paced, and people move in between companies, perhaps more frequently than we, uh, from academia. But this lays the ground for the session. Please, Amnir. Thank you very much, Jak. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So it, it has been seven years that I've been here also and with Tavi presenting, and I'm so happy that our data science seminar series are still alive. Uh, and this is something that I will say thanks to all speakers, especially thank you to Jak that he keeps this tradition. Um, so as uh, Jak said, that we have really distinguished speakers. Uh, they are colleagues and friends that they join us today here, and I'm so happy that uh, they they answered our call to, to show up here and to present their project, especially on topics that are really important for our future with respect to sustainability 
and not only with respect to mobility and transportation, but also for our communities. Because at the end of the day, we have to change the perspective. We are not serving vehicles, we are serving as citizens and humans. And we have to change our way of thinking with respect to solving problems around mobility uh, and sustainability. Uh, so without further ado, our first presenter is uh, Navid, so Mohammed, so he's uh, with us, an associate professor of autonomous driving and also a co-head of uh, EDL, Autonomous Driving Lab, which is we are very proud of having here, uh, which is built in collaboration with Bolt. So I will give the floor to, to Navid. Thank you. And just to add the two points. So please don't forget for next uh, data science seminar. So it will be on 24th of January, and it will be moderated by uh, our famous Jan Aru. So I think everybody knows him. Um, and I think you should not miss it because we will have some surprises there. And, uh, and also for, uh, for uh, after the presentation, please, if you have any question, just raise your hand and then we will give you a micro to, to answer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amnir, for the uh, nice introduction. Uh, uh, I'm Naveed, and uh, so the, the, the topic uh, of my presentation today is autonomous driving developments and uh, challenges. Uh, so the way uh, uh, I would like to start it by asking you how many of you can formally define what autonomy in uh, uh, autonomous driving is? Autonomous driving? Autonom for autonomous driving. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So that's correct. Uh, uh, very simply, you can define it by the ability of a vehicle to be able to move from point A to point B without the intervention of a human operator. You know, that's the key there. Uh, no human intervening. Uh, and there's many advantages. Of course, it's very uh, tightly coupled with uh, sustainability. Uh, as uh, uh, more and more vehicles become autonomous, the promise is that uh, there will, uh, will be less and less congestions on the roads. There will be more possibilities to uh, use uh, shared vehicles uh, between uh, uh, people. People won't be you know, driving around only one person in a vehicle at a time. Uh, and in addition to that, there's other advantages. Uh, for example, safer roads. Uh, all the um, accidents that are caused by human error, we would be able to get uh, rid of them, which is actually uh, more than 95% of the ac accidents uh, on the roads. Uh, mobility for all, you know, kids uh, could uh, travel around without uh, having a driver's license, for example. You know, you wouldn't need a driver's license, et cetera. Um, and the way that I have, so I have titled the presentation uh, Developments and Challenges, but the way that I have uh, uh, structured it is not, you know, first I talk about all the uh, challenges and then I talk about all the developments. It's not like that. So I'll talk about uh, two different uh, aspects of autonomous driving. One is the general autonomous driving landscape in the world. What's the current state uh, of autonomous driving? And uh, then I'll talk about what we are doing here at Autonomous Driving Lab. Uh, what, where do we stand? Where, where do we focus, uh, uh, et cetera? So let's begin with uh, the first part, which is the general uh, autonomous driving landscape in the world. Uh, as we defined it uh, a few minutes ago, driving from point A to point B without intervention from a, a human operator, doesn't it seem very simple? Why don't we have autonomous cars all around us? The, the answer to it is actually quite straightforward. Uh, there's a, a 2017 article by Rodney Brooks. If you have heard about him, uh, Rodney Brooks is uh, also the guy who uh, leads uh, uh, the company that makes Roombas, you know, these vacuum cleaning robots. So he has been in robotics for a long, long time. He wrote an article uh, for IEEE Spectrum in 2017, which was titled, The Big Problem with Self-Driving Cars is People. And that actually, is true, was true back then, is true today. You know, five years of billions of uh, dollars, euros spent uh, on autonomous driving research. Academia is a small fraction of it, but there's a lot of research that has uh, been uh, conducted in industry on autonomous driving. Uh, in this article, so it's a very, very accessible article, so I recommend uh, any one of you uh, uh, could, you know, read and understand it. It's, for written, it's written for a technical audience, you know, you don't have to be an expert in autonomous driving. But he, for example, there are a couple of figures from the, from the article. For a human driver, if two people are uh, 
uh, standing at a crosswalk and talking to each other, a human driver wouldn't see them as a risk, uh, uh, as a person who would just jump uh, in the next uh, instant of time on the uh, crosswalk. But if they finish their conversation and they turn, one of them turns around towards the road, then a human driver would know right away that you know, they are about to uh, put their uh, step uh, foot on the crosswalk. For a human uh, driver, it's uh, very instinctive. For a vehicle, autonomous vehicle, it's completely non-trivial. Another example, there's a very narrow road because of snow uh, on both sides. A human a pedestrian is walking. A human driver can very easily judge if it's safe to overtake this pedestrian, or should I just follow them because there's not enough space on the road. For an autonomous vehicle, it's very non-trivial. So these are just a couple of examples, but uh, there's the element of people is the bottleneck, you know, in uh, uh, wide-scale, uh, large-scale, basically, uh, deployment of autonomous vehicles. Um, and most of the companies that are out there, uh, if you follow news, uh, there's a, basically a long tail of uh, uh, very rare situations that are very, very hard to account for all of them one by one, you know, in a uh, modular system uh, which needs to be deployed. Uh, an autonomous driving system, I mean. Uh, so uh, moving on to what the state of autonomous driving, uh, commercially available or commercially deployed of autonomous driving uh, systems uh, out there in the world today is. Um, for that, I would like to use actually uh, this uh, definition of levels of autonomy. Uh, one of the most widely used standards in the world is this uh, SAE standards, uh, standard for uh, automation in uh, autonomous vehicles. And uh, it uh, basically divides uh, autonomy into five, six levels, zero to five. Zero is no automation at all, you know, a standard car, no uh, emergency braking, no cruise control, etc. that's level zero. Level uh, five would be a vehicle that can perform in all geographical locations without any uh, weather condition restrictions, etc. Uh, that would be a fully autonomous vehicle, level five. Um, and uh, in the middle, there are different levels that I will explain uh, in different slides as I you know, explain uh, the state of autonomous driving systems today. Um, a question to you. You might have, you know, seen a Tesla, uh, like driven in a Tesla yourself, or you might have seen videos uh, of uh, the Tesla's uh, autopilot or uh, full self-driving uh, um, capability system. So, a question is, where do you think on this spectrum of zero to five does this uh, Tesla system lie? Okay, so three, four, and so two, three, and four is three answers that I heard, right? Um, the uh, Correct answer is two. Uh, the reason is that these uh, levels of automation, they are very cleverly, in my opinion, uh, set up uh, because uh, they also take into account the liability or the responsibility that the vehicle is willing to take, not just the functionalities that it has, so the, if you know, it can autonomously operate, uh, not only the level of that, but also the level of disengagement that a driver can have. Level two is where the vehicle can have a lot of automation, but driver is still always responsible for what the vehicle does, and driver should be willing to take over at any instant. That's level two. And that's where Tesla, uh, you know, autopilot and full self-driving capability systems currently are. Uh, level three is uh, one step ahead. In level three, you can completely disengage, but the vehicle can request you to take over and then you, there's a uh, time frame within which you need to take over. Uh, and the natural question that comes to mind is, are there any level three systems out there today? And uh, the answer to that is very interesting because until last year, there, were, there was no level three systems out there, okay, commercially available. But this year it has changed. So uh, there's a system uh, by Mercedes-Benz uh, uh, called the Drive Pilot. Uh, which got, app got approval for sale uh, this year. Uh, it's a level three system. It gives um, a driver 10 seconds, basically. So once the vehicle requests the driver to take over, driver can disengage, you know, you can read a book or you can watch a video while the vehicle is in the autonomous mode. But if the vehicle requests you to take over, you have 10 seconds max. After that 10 seconds, the vehicle will come to a stop. 
and uh, start to call you know, emergency services, uh, thinking that you maybe are uh, uh, undergoing a medical condition, for example. You know. So uh, what is the uh, operational design domain of this system? Um, you need to have uh, clear lane markings on the roads. The, uh, you need to have clear whether it needs to be moderate or heavy traffic. What it means is that you cannot uh, engage the system when you are on a uh, highway and there's no vehicles in front of you. you know? uh, so there's many restrictions. And this capability is only available at some highways in uh, uh, US. Uh, the circle on the uh, right bottom uh, uh, image shows the highways that are already uh, you know, suitable for this system. But uh, this network, of course, will grow as the system only got uh, approval this year. Uh, but that's the current state of the art. You know, like uh, level three, only one system out there. Uh, level four is full autonomy, but in uh, restricted geographical uh, zones and um, uh, good weather conditions, let's say. Are there any uh, systems out there at level four? Yes, there are. There are these... Uh, you know, autonomous uh, taxi services uh, uh, out there. For example, Waymo, which was uh, which started as the Google self-driving car project and then became you know uh, an independent company, uh, Waymo. Uh, so they offer uh, autonomous taxi services in Phoenix, uh, Arizona, and San Francisco, uh, California, and U.S. Uh, there was another. Uh, there is another company, Cruise. You might have heard about them. They were in news recently. They. Uh, 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 had some setbacks, they, their vehicles were involved in uh, some crashes, and they lost the ability to operate in California, and they voluntarily also stopped operating in uh, some other places in US where they were operating. So the point is that there are uh, level four systems out there, but uh, yeah, mm, few, and they're not very widespread in terms of geographical coverage, you know, where they are available. Uh, and uh, ne next natural question, level five. L level five is not there yet, and level five is, in my opinion, you know, like decades away. So the vehicle which has, which can operate autonomously, without ge geographical uh, restrictions and without uh, weather condition restrictions, that's really uh, uh, far, especially because of the challenge of the people aspect in autonomous driving. Um, that actually brings me to the next part of my presentation, which is the autonomous driving lab here. What are we doing? Uh, where do we stand? Uh, what are our plans? Uh, so the lab was uh, set up in uh, 2019. Uh, we have a three-pronged uh, strategy to foment uh, autonomous driving uh, you know, research and development in Estonia. We focus on education, technology, and research, these three areas. So I'll talk about them one by one. Uh, talking about education, we try to build workforce for uh, autonomous driving through you know, giving uh, courses, uh, thesis uh, projects, you know, bachelor, master, as well as doctoral thesis. Um, so one of the things that we saw uh, when we started giving education in autonomous driving is that, you know, students, they have sometimes very limited uh, amount of time and they need to learn things very fast uh, to be able to start, you know, like uh, testing algorithms, proposing algorithms. So we uh, have tried to uh, overcome that challenge uh, in a number of ways. For example, we uh, have uh, started competitions. We, we hold competitions with small-sized vehicles instead of a uh, full-size uh, vehicle that you would operate and test in uh, uh, real traffic outside. And we also have uh, uh, competitions where students they can uh, use data uh, offline. So we record, you know, like data from uh, a real environment, and then they can play with the data offline and uh, uh, learn from it. Basically, autonomous driving and yeah, even conduct research. We are also developing uh, simulations. Uh, so first we develop, developed a simulation of uh, the city center of Tartu, and now we are going to the whole Tartu. So uh, in the bottom uh, right, you see an image uh, that shows you the scale of uh, simulation of Tartu city that we are creating. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it uses actually um, data from the Estonian land board. And uh, you know, so you can see these buildings that are shown in the image there. They are actually real buildings which physically also exist at the same location in Tartu city. And the size of the buildings and the shape of the buildings, it very uh, closely corresponds to uh, the real uh, life uh, in Tartu. Uh, so uh, that's what we are building. Another uh, challenge that we saw was uh, the autonomy software stacks that are out there. So we were using an autonomy uh, software stack called AutoWare, which is open source, but it's huge, very hard to 
uh, tracks, you know, the evolution, very hard to debug for students especially. So we thought of developing our own uh, autonomy stack, which we uh, called AutoWare Mini. Uh, so the idea was that it's based on Python and ROS, and students can, you know, very easily start uh, playing uh, with it, and uh, hence uh, start to uh, basically test and develop different uh, autonomy uh, algorithms uh, using this, uh, this uh, software stack that we are developing. Um, Another thing that we uh, conducted uh, uh, last year was an on-demand uh, transportation project. So this was spring 2022. In this project, we used, uh, so our vehicle became, uh, which is shown uh, uh, on uh, top right here, became a part of the uh, uh, transportation uh, fleet here in the suburbs uh, of uh, Tartu. We conducted this project. With the, so there were uh, some uh, partners involved, the city of Tartu, Trefest, Berkman, Technologies and Modern Mobility. Uh, so this track shown here on the bottom right is 66 kilometers uh, of uh, lanes uh, and uh, basically 26 bus stops and you know different uh, traffic lights, uh, street crossings that it covers. And what we saw in that project, so basically we offered uh, rides to real passengers, you know, real people, uh, basically uh, people who would actually request a ride uh, from uh, the city of Tartu. Uh, and uh, we drove 331 kilometers, and in total, we had to take over the vehicle. So the auto autonomy had to be engaged during the vehicle operation 252 uh, times. And uh, the, in terms of uh, some metrics, you know, 30, uh, 93% uh, of the distance was driven autonomously, and uh, around 85, 86% of the time uh, the vehicle was running was autonomous. Uh, here, we observed the same thing uh, that. Uh, one of the uh, most uh, significant, uh, you know, aspects that uh, uh, restricts the autonomy is also the pe uh, people's aspect. You know, you have uh, crosswalks uh, where you have to give way to other uh, pedestrians. You have uh, T junctions and intersections where you have to give way to other uh, vehicles that have priority over you, etc. So that all is, uh, you know, the people's aspect shows the people's aspect of uh, the challenge challenges that are there in autonomous driving today. Um, uh, fast forward to this this fall, we are actually rerunning the same uh, paths that we ran during the uh, spring 2020 project, but now we are using this uh, AutoWare Mini autonomy stack that we have developed ourselves. You know, so the idea is to see how where does our autonomy stack stand? Does the uh, number of engagements reduce? Does the amount of uh, time and amount of distance that we drive autonomously go up? So we have uh, conducted the rides. Uh, this time, of course, because we wanted to simulate the exact same rides that we have conducted previously, the rides were not offered to uh, general public, but it has been students uh, from the university as well as ourselves. Uh, we have been simulating or those, I mean, simulating in the sense that we re-running the same routes again. And uh, over 95% of the, there's a 95% overlap between the runs that were in the original project and now that we have rerun. There are like uh, some percent of uh, mismatch uh, because of, you know, uh, there's construction works on the roads, et cetera. But largely, we managed to conduct the same rides, and now we'll uh, basically see where do we stand now. Have we improved? Uh, um, moving on to the research at uh, Autonomous Driving Lab. This is where we focus. So levels four and five is where our focus is. We, you know, are, so the, one of the biggest benefits of being in academia is you can really look at the future. You don't have uh, the, the compulsion to commercialize something that you're working on tomorrow and make profit. You know, you have the independence to work, uh, think long term. And uh, so that's why level four and five is where we focus. Uh, in terms of the areas that we are investigating, there's like plenty of areas, some, uh, they're, uh, led by uh, different colleagues uh, at Autonomous Driving Lab. Some of uh, them are here, some of them are not, but yeah, uh, we have a wonderful team. Uh, I personally am uh, in interested or investigating uh, some of the areas from which I can give you some highlights also. Uh, for example, we have developed uh, uh, an algorithm recently and uh, got it accepted at a general web, uh, which is on giving way to uh, other vehicles, other priority vehicles at uh, roundabouts, uh, intersections, T-junctions, et cetera. And then some work on uh, you know, change detection in maps. You have um, a map of an environment, but the environment evolves over time. How do you detect that it has evolved and it needs to be remapped for an autonomous vehicle to be able to operate? Uh, similarly, we have conducted some uh, research in uh, 
perception in harsh weather conditions, which is really relevant to you know, the Nordic uh, context. And similarly, how do you perceive uh, what's around you in uh, sun glare? For humans, it's, these are very, very instinctive things. But for autonomous vehicle, for an autonomous vehicle, these are non-trivial problems. Uh, and we are also looking at some futuristic things, you know, how if you, as a human driver, you know, you can uh, overtake a long vehicle in front of you, you kind of go out of your lane and you see what's, uh, how long the vehicle, a truck, a long truck in front of you is. Uh, but for how does an autonomous vehicle do it? Uh, we have been looking into, you know, can we use airflow, for example, behind uh, a long truck? Uh, so this study is just in simulation yet. We haven't really can, uh, tested it in real world. But yeah, uh, what I'm trying to say is that, yeah, we're looking at level four and five and really uh, doing, uh, well, solving some current problems as well as some looking at some futuristic, you know, uh, uh, how to say, aspects of uh, autonomous driving. Uh, the take home message, first thing, uh, the biggest problem in autonomous driving, what's holding us back, you know, over the widespread uh, deployment of autonomous vehicles is, is people. The uncertainty that comes with pedestrians, human drivers, etc. Uh, there's significant progress in uh, sub-level 5 systems, but level 5 systems are you know, far into the future. Uh, and at, at uh, Autonomous Driving Lab, uh, our uh, focus is on level 4 and 5, and we give, uh, you know, like, uh, we focus on three aspects of autonomous driving, education, technology, and research. So this is my take-home message. You are very welcome to come join us, you know, uh, as, as, as thesis students, as uh, future engineers, uh, researchers. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Navid. Um, and uh, now we'll open the floor for questions. So we have two questions out there. First of all, thank you very much for the great presentation. So my question is, uh, how do you think these current advances with uh, large language models, can this propel forward autonomous driving? And if so, how do you uh, think it could? OK. So. Um, uh, I have seen some studies that already have, you know, tested uh, how would uh, large language models uh, respond to situations in traffic. You know, you give a, uh, you sh like a, a driver's uh, test, you know, a uh, driver's license test. You show up image to the large language model, you say, what do you see and what would you do in this kind of situation, some things like that. But those studies don't really show, uh, you know, like as robust of results as it would be needed for an autonomous vehicle to operate, obviously. You know, large language models, they have their limitations. Having said that, uh, beyond uh, the current studies that I have seen, it's very, very uh, like uh, hard to, to comment how the large language models themselves will evolve. You know, and maybe those evolved versions of the LLMs would have capabilities that the current ones don't have. You know, that, that's uh, one thing that might happen, might not happen. But the current LLMs, they don't really have the capabilities which are needed for autonomous driving, according to the studies that I have seen so far. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, most, uh, thanks for the overview. First, and uh, my question is that most of the autonomous vehicle systems are based on a modular approach, but uh, there is another way to do it, and that is end-to-end. -end. Uh, uh, is there any hope for it in the future, or what's the state of it in the industry? Okay, so uh, that's a very good question. So we at the lab have been uh, investigating actually both uh, types, uh, modular systems as well as end-to-end. -end. End-to-end uh, -end systems, they have more challenges, I would say, currently, you know, given the state of the deep uh, neural networks currently that we have, uh, because the long tail of uh, exceptions when you are on the road and dealing with people is, uh, is hard to be uh, solved with the current end-to-end -end models that we have in autonomous driving. So what, uh, what does that mean? What it means is that when you want to deploy them, as level four and five systems, you would have challenges in getting approvals, you know, like uh, regulatory uh, uh, approvals. With, model, uh, with modular systems, it's a little bit easier to get uh, regulatory approvals. So that's why the systems that exist out there, 
especially when you go towards the, uh, you know, like level four and five, uh, they are modular systems. But level two, you can do anything. That's why Tesla is more heavily reliant on, uh, you know, neural networks than uh, Waymo, for example, as far as I understand. Yep. Thanks. I have another question here. I don't want to have very long answer, but um, this prediction of the lorry length, actually when I am driving, I feel that when I'm behind lorries that my car consumes less petrol. So what is the actual best place to be so that I, um, I use um, less fuel and still safe? Can you predict that? Uh, isn't that a uh, good question to answer? It, it surely is an interesting question to answer. Um, of course, you know, when you're driving, uh, safe distance is one thing that uh, dictates how far you uh, should be. But the question of efficiency uh, it can surely is something that these simulations can answer. Indeed. Good idea. Yeah. Any other questions? There's one over there. Can you raise, can you raise your hand, please? I think Pella. No? No. Oh. no. <laughs> All right. Uh, then I have one question a little bit, uh, I will say, in a high level. So in your opinion, do you see the implementation of autonomous driving as a, as a way to solve our urban mobility problems? It surely is a part of it. It surely is a part of it. Because when the more and more uh, vehicles are autonomous, we'll have less and less congestions, you know, because the vehicles can simply cooperate with each other in, uh, uh, in deciding what speed to follow, what routes to take, etc. So uh, over time, that's, of course, where we are heading. And that, uh, you know, is linked to autonomy. So the sustainability uh, is linked to autonomy, for sure. And do you think this, this time is, is, is like in 10 years, 20 years? So uh, this is a very good question. Uh, the thing is, um, the solutions uh, that can be implemented in future is more early. But we should also keep in mind that a vehicle that is not autonomous today and is sold to the, to, in the market will stay on the roads for 20, 30 years, which means that the last vehicle, which is not autonomous, let's say sold X number of years from now, will stay on the roads 20, 30 years from that X uh, year. So it means that for a long time, there will be a mix. And in that mix, of course, it's more challenging to, you know, like have a, a completely uh, uh, synchronized uh, fleet out there. But surely these things will happen over time. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can we applaud here, Navid, for us? Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Small thanks gift. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, now we will move to our next speaker. So um, we have uh, Peter Vas Vasislev. I hope I pronounced it correct. Um, now we will have a different taste, so from a perspective of landscape architecture. Um, and Peter here will talk about how uh, do landscape architecture collect uh, park usage data. So Peter is a lecturer of landscape architecture at the Estonian University of Life Sciences. Uh, he's currently a researcher and he's literally focused on on patterns in urban green and blue areas. Uh, floor is yours, Peter. Thank you very much. Thank you. The, don't go. Thank you. Hello. Um, I come from University of Life Sciences, and I teach landscape architects. Uh, first of all, I would like to explain what landscape architects actually do. We design outdoor spaces. And the scale of the changes uh, that we do or go through is very different. It can be a project where you're dealing with visual impact of wind turbines and uh, very large areas. But on the other end of the scale, you can be dealing with something very small. Uh, so it could be uh, designing a very small private garden or it can be... Uh, a public space. Uh, here's an example of uh, small-scale interventions that we were doing as a research project. And uh, uh, the idea was that small urban acupunctures, we call them, could have large impact on the usability of the area. So we proposed to build some uh, platforms in rather 
underused area. It's, it's a very rocky beach. Uh, and uh, we thought that we'd like to see how effective our intervention will be. So we'll have to come up with a way of measuring our effectiveness. So we decided to use observations to see what people do at the site and uh, where do they go and who actually go, uh, goes uh, where. And uh, so we developed um, uh, a tool or implementation and uh, collected data. Um, here's an example of a point cloud. Uh, each one of these blue dots contains a GIS uh, database with uh, um, variables like gender, age group, uh, the social interaction would be whether it's alone or uh, in pairs or in a group. And then the second column is uh, primary activity and then secondary activities. So we call this uh, tool BBAT for Blue Health Behavior Assessment Tool. And why would we want to do that sort of undertaking? It's a manual process. So it's rather labor intensive to go through the area and, and you want to take multiple measurements. So you want to know what do people do in the mornings? Where do they go at lunchtime? Is there any difference between workday and the weekend? So that basically means a repeated measurements uh, over the full area. But the benefit on the right-hand side, uh, the column, is that, first of all, it's a reliable factual uh, knowledge about the usage of the area. You can go to uh, politicians and say, we've measured the site, this is how it's being used. It's not a gut feeling, and it's very important because you need to provide some evidence when you're making decisions, especially when money is involved and political interests. Uh, the last point here is uh, monitoring the change. So it's, it's possible to take a snapshot of how the area operates right now, but if you repeat that process, it's possible also to monitor the changes because you know, your own uh, implementation, let's say this uh, small uh, decks that we constructed, are they effective or not? So uh, here's an example of uh, heat maps. Uh, so instead of displaying all these uh, individual dots, uh, they are agglomerated into a heat map. It's a graphical representation of uh, intensity. So the glow intensity means more people. And these uh, smaller dots, uh -huh, okay, learning. Uh, these red dots, these are the locations of these uh, small uh, uh, benches and platforms. So they align with the uh, intensity map, so uh, maybe we were successful. <laughs> right. Data collection. This is how it works. Uh, first of all, we thought, okay, let's do a tablet computer, uh, quantum JS open software, quite cheap thing to acquire. Uh, so we bought a bunch of these electronic things and later on we thought, hmm, can we skip the bad weather uh, data collection on paper forms? So I came up with the solution, just a plastic bag. Very cheap, works. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, Moving on. <laughs> so how uh, basically the, the process is that the area is rather large. So looking for one location, you will not be able to cover the full area. So we have subdivided the area into subunits, so these uh, coverage areas. And in each of these coverage areas, the observer is supposed to stop and take 360 degree swoop and record everyone uh, who's in that area. 
that depends or relies on the observer's ability to uh, take note of the landmarks. So the, the observer has to be able to look on the map and be able to relate to the landmarks that actually are uh, in the landscape. It's preferable to uh, walk at the same track, so you're covering the full area and following the same uh, uh, procedure always. Uh, in small areas, you're quite close to the observer, uh, to the uh, people, so no problems. But um, let's say uh, somebody is swimming out at the sea, you cannot really see uh, is it uh, a man or a woman, for example. Same problem with uh, age groups, you know, guessing uh, somebody from a distance, is it a child or is it a teenager, sometimes be, becomes problematic. So we have some defaults. So if you don't know, Default to male, and uh, if you don't know the age, then default to the average adult. Sorry, <laughs> that's the way it goes. <laughs> default values. But uh, from the perspective of data science, default values, maybe you can relate to that uh, kind of uh, problem or conundrum. Okay, uh, we developed this tool and we thought, hmm, it works. Uh, so let's observe some other areas. So here's uh, an example of uh, Tartu city center. We've been uh, conducting observations for four years. Uh, each summer we observe the um, park, nameless park near Emayogi. Uh, it's uh, from the town hall square uh, to the uh, uh, market building. Then we uh, also observe the unfortunate uh, Central Park. It will be uh, changed completely quite soon. And the third park is uh, right next to it, uh, next to Kaubama, this Ueturu Park. But uh, it's, it's too far off and I'm not showing that data. So these are the individual dots uh, from year 2020. And, uh, well, the observations are written out here, 25 times uh, observed in Emaya Park and the Central Park, we observed 23 times, and the number of dots as well, <laughs> yes. Okay, next year. Here we resorted to fewer sampling uh, sessions, only 12, and uh, of course the, the number of dots is smaller. Okay, now I'm only showing you the raw data. And usually this raw data is very messy. Uh, but from here you can already see some patterns. For example, um, the, uh, the path network is very visible from these dots. It's, it's quite uh, pronounced uh, that majority of people are using the paved areas. So all the planted areas are not very much used physically, not visually, of course. When people are moving through the park, they are seeing these green areas, the, the flower beds, the bushes, and the, the grass, and so on. But they're not physically in these areas quite often. So uh, there's one of these conundrums. Uh, you're getting truth, you're measuring something, and you are observing things objectively, but you're not seeing inside someone's head. So uh, you cannot pinpoint the, the emotional response of that one person and what they were looking at at the time. So some shortcomings as well, of course. Okay. Then uh, you can see some clusters. Um, some large bubbles in the central park in the middle, there was an intervention, not done by us, somebody else did the skating ramp. So there's a large bubble of yellow dots, uh, right, uh, sorry, right here. <laughs> so that was interesting because uh, when you think skating ramp, that automatically 
means teenagers and children. Doing what? Skating? Let's see. <laughs> okay. So that's the ramp itself. Okay. Uh, here's a heat map again uh, with all uh, user groups. Uh, so it's everyone put together. And the years uh, 2019, uh, sorry, 20, 21, and 22. Uh, in the first map, uh, there was no skate, uh, skate ramp. Uh, after the building in the central map, you can see the, the, uh, the red uh, bubble has increased in size, indicating that there are more people there. Okay, maybe the ramp was working. Okay, this bar chart, um, we look at the gender and age groups. Uh, the first three columns are uh, observed people in the central, uh, central park. The last red column is the share of that same demographic group in the population of the city of Tartu. So you can see, for example, uh, the overrepresentation by uh, adult, uh, both male and female uh, users, compared to the uh, population uh, in the city itself. A large underrepresentation by older people. Uh, so elderly are underrepresented, meaning we can ask questions like, why are they not going to the park? Now, teenagers and children. Uh, the first year uh, was without the skate ramp. In the second and the third column, you can see uh, that the numbers are increasing to the same proportion as the uh, population would show. Okay. Another way of looking at this is through um, Shannon's diversity index. This is used usually in uh, ecology, but uh, instead of uh, the richness and diversity of species, we take the same social groups and uh, see how diverse uh, each one of these areas is. And again, you can see that lilac uh, points in the middle of the park are rather diverse, indicating that that area is being used by various people and doing various activities. Okay, teenagers. <laughs> so, uh, filtering out everything else, only teenage group, age group, and uh, here is the heat map of the usage. The darker a uh, dashed line indicates the actual location of the skate park. The red dot in the middle image is misaligned. And it's not a mistake. <laughs> it actually means that uh, teenagers were not using the skate ramp itself they were hanging around that skate ramp. The last image on the right hand, you see a large drop. There are some teenagers there, and there's a blob of yellow glow, but much smaller. So all of a sudden, it fell out of popularity. It was not interesting. It's the second year. Ah, let's find something new, interesting. So uh, what was happening was that few of the teenagers were actually uh, using the skate ramp. Everyone else was standing and watching, hanging around, spending time. That's actually what you want. That's a positive thing. Uh, if you look at the, the table from the perspective of uh, the activities, what kind of activities are happening, Again, you can see uh, the same idea that uh, I've highlighted the kick scooter and rollerblading, and it's only taking up few percentage points of overall activities. So you think that you're introducing a skating ramp, and people will be 
skateboarding on it, but actually you have created a magnet and it has attracted more users than actually would have been if you were close-minded. Young children. First map is uh, without the skate ramp. Second map, the center map, is uh, when teenagers took the area over. And then the third map, when the area fell out of favor from teenagers, then young kids had their opportunity the next year. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, sad that it's over. Uh, they uh, dismantled uh, the skate ramp. Okay, I'm almost finished with the presentation. Um, the problems, uh, first of all, uh, there are of course some problems when you're collecting data like this. Uh, skill requirements, as I mentioned, you have to be able to uh, look at the map and find where you are. The training of this technology is roughly three hours, so it's a lot of time. And you have to supervise the data, the first files that are being sent in by students. You have to check whether they're actually doing things the way they're supposed to do. There are sampling consistency problems. Uh, uh, it's quite uh, common to take assumptions. So uh, uh, it's, it's important to uh, remind the observers that uh, you have to stick to the method, the human factor. And uh, mistakes of uh, data entry, uh, last slides. For example, here uh, you see a phantom click where in uh, very cold uh, weather the sensitivity of the tablet goes bonkers and you have phantom clicks. Uh, or here the data overload where there's too many people and too little time and uh, the observer misses uh, some data fields. Okay, that's the uh, advertisement. Sorry I took over time. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Please, please applaud. <laughs> All right, so now we open the floor again to questions. Okay, we have one question out there. Yeah, um, regarding the data collecting, have you tried any uh, steps that involve automating the data collection, such as either mobile positioning data or camera data, which would kind of lose the, I don't know, qualitative fields where you were able to mark down the gender of the person, the age of the person, but you would still be able to collect uh, location data. And the second question, the study on the Central Park, has, has it had any impact on the, I don't know, potentially the decisions of the city council yet? I start with the second question. Uh, it has had no impact. Uh, I have not. Uh, I've given up on this uh, idea. I first suggested that maybe the building should be built on the paved area over the street, but uh, no, no. So uh, no effect. But uh, more interesting is the the question of automation. Um, I've looked at trying to use uh, automated systems. Cameras, for example, could very easily be trained to detect someone and uh, pinpoint someone. There are some uh, available systems. Um, and uh, first of all, it's more expensive uh, these days at the moment. The, the tablet and uh, so on uh, maybe is the only uh, uh, expense. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, but uh, the second very important question is, are you going to do the same things in the park as you're being watched by a camera? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> behave. <laughs> so uh, one thing is this uh, observation uh, bias where, where you are inflicting, uh, uh, you, you're conditioning people to behave in a certain way. That's, that's one of the, the biggest problems. And the ethical conundrum, like uh, even if you're collecting data in a safe way and all that is taken care of, it's always uh, a challenge uh, to go through the ethics uh, evaluation and so on. Right, thanks. Any other questions? OK, 
Okay, I have one question out there. Well, thank you for the very interesting presentation. I was wondering whether the settings of the park also have a role in uh, in how people use it, because we know in the central park, uh, some parts are kind of nice and neat, and yes. some are kind of which we think are more natural, and we let the nature be there, but some people do not like it so much, so are we able to observe that as well and make any conclusions? Thank you. Uh, the setting is very important. Uh, I started with the example from Tallinn, from uh, Kopli uh, area, and these small uh, platforms were exactly this abandoned nature kind of thing, so it attracts different people. Uh, the, the tidy and nice uh, area usually is used by somebody else, and also the activity palette is very different. So that's very, very much to the point. Uh, unfortunately, in the Central Park, the difference is very small, and uh, the number of people who are actually involved in these uh, uh, ecologically more uh, various uh, areas, uh, too, too few uh, data points to actually get any meaningful uh, uh, answers. All right, so we have one last question. So we are running out of time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I was wondering uh, whether you know that uh, the public sector is using your, your data and your input because you're collecting data on the effect of the local interventions, how you change the setting, how people come there if you put those small benches, and, and whether they have for example, ordered some monitoring of their um, of their any interventions in street spaces, parks, uh, beaches, etc. So, what is your cooperation with the public sector, the local municipalities? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so far, this has been uh, done only as an enthusiasm project. So, I have uh, not. Um, been uh, very much in cooperation with different municipalities. I see there's a potential, of course, uh, but uh, uh, I personally come from the uh, sector that I develop the tool and uh, think how it works and I teach it to the students. And uh, so the, the marketing part and the communication part, it's, it's a very, uh, very much a job on its own. So, uh, with, with limited resources and the size of our department, can't do that. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, yeah. Peter. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so um, now we will move to uh, um, how we make money, right? So, uh, I think. Uh, we have a distinguished speaker also here, so uh, Tavi Taminsta will talk about computer vision, uh, especially in uh, physical spaces. So to introduce a little bit Tavi, so he's a CTO and co-founder of uh, a computer vision startup called uh, FEMA. Uh, he has been working on applied machine learning for, I would say, eight to seven years, Nine. slightly more. Um, and they are really focused on high performance, especially focused on movement uh, data and spaces. Um, so I hope you will enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Tavi. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Tavi, uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, what we do at FIMA. Uh, it's going to be a great follow-up because what we do is we turn camera data into movement data. Um, <clears throat> so for the last eight, seven, nine years, I don't really remember, remember I've been involved with uh, applied machine learning. Uh, and for the last five years, most of that has been actually with physical space movement data. Whether it's uh, cell phone data, Wi-Fi data, or uh, camera movement data, I've kind of gone through all of them. And what I'm going to tell you today is kind of, the disclaimer is that this is kind of my story. This is uh, what I've seen companies, cities, uh, everybody else kind of uh, respond to on using physical movement data. So what I'm going to talk to you today. Um, so first, the uh, first thing I'm going to talk to you about is what is physical space data, and why I'm going to talk <laughs> this a little bit about is I'm going to challenge the idea of physical space data and how it should be used a little bit. 
this comes, brings me to my next point on trash data versus algorithmic data. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go as far as say as most of the physical space data that is collected is trash data, uh, but I am frustrated with um, how data gets used these days. Um, I'm not going to sell you on FIMA, but I am going to talk, tell you a little bit about what we do, because most of the things that um, we have built, we have built them in a way so that physical space data actually gets used. And the key differentiating factor there is being flexible. And I'll tell a little bit about why. And of course, it wouldn't be a data science seminar these days without generative AI and chat GPT. So I'll talk a little bit about what we're doing there as well. So first thing, uh, what is physical space movement data? So seven years ago, when we got started, uh, physical space data was basically this. Understanding how uh, people move in an urban environment. More specifically, something like this. So this is a uh, city in a country that used to be in the European Union. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this was a project we did for them around three or four years ago. Uh, they set up, uh, they had their own existing cameras. So one of the benefits of FIMA is that you don't have to set up any new cameras. You can connect it to any existing uh, street camera or CCTV feed. Um, they set up all the cameras. And when we asked them, why do you want this data? What are you going to use it for? Their uh, response was model share. We want to understand how many cars, how many bus, how many trucks are on the street. OK, why? What are you going to do with that data? Are you going to change the streets? Are you going to change the bus schedules? No, 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 we have to like, do reporting. And yeah, possibly we'll put that into city planning, but that's going to happen in a year. But we need data. So <clears throat> if today somebody comes in and says, we're going to do model share, what I'm hearing is, I don't really know what I'm going to use the data for. Um, now, obviously, somebody might actually need the model share data. What ended up happening here is about Six months into the project, <coughs> they, there came a re request. You see there's a bus station here. The request was, how many people use public transportation? What ended up happening was because if a bus drives here, it will completely obscure that um, uh, bus stop. The only way we can get that data is measure how many buses drive past it, uh, apply some sort of um, value to the bus that it carries a, a certain number of people uh, on the bus and then just calculate it together. You end up with an estimation. And what I understand is that um, estimations don't really work in physical space analytics. Uh, neither does machine learning very well. Why? Because in very busy environments, uh, especially like city centers, one of the things that very often gets tossed, tossed to the side is that the pattern that the machine learning algorithm needs to learn changes very quickly. And if the pattern changes very quickly, it doesn't really matter how much data you have going back. It's almost impossible to kind of predict the future in this case. So instead of this customer coming to us and saying, we want uh, modal share data, what they should have said to us is we want to kind of detect how many people come on and off the bus, and we would actually have to place cameras in different locations, gone through the GDPR process of uh, understanding where and how we can measure these people, et cetera, et cetera. But this is what I kind of call trash data. So what I think physical space data is that it's any data that describes the efficiency of a physical space. What we figured out from this uh, early on uh, city experiment, well, it was an experiment, it was a project, was that if we want to have any long-lasting impact on our built environment becoming in any way better, we need to start focusing on uh, algorithmic processes. And these are algorithmic processes that you can describe in the physical space, measure them, and make them more effective. And physical space is not only cities. Physical space is uh, airports, ports, uh, it's basically anywhere where people move. And, and, and that movement creates some sort of value for them. And value might be, I'm having a nice time at the park, just we had l l last time around. So <clears throat> now I call this data trash data, but 
The difference between gather all data and a specific algorithmic process analysis is that this gather all data is only good for trend analysis, understanding if I get 500 people more than I did last week, or anomaly detection. There was a bike marathon uh, yesterday. I saw a spike of 1,000 bikes, right? That's almost all that it's good for. Versus if you have a specific um, uh, algorithmic process that you can analyze, like people coming on and off the bus, then you can use this data to actually optimize this process. And I'm going to show you a few cases on how we work as well. Uh, before I get into that, how FIMO works. So I mentioned um, one of our benefits is that um, um, anybody can come in, use existing camera. It can be a smartphone. We have uh, customers in Finland who are using smartphones as, as indoor cameras. Um, attach FIMO to that uh, video stream and start collecting um, uh, movement data, physical movement data. The really cool part about this is that um, if you have this algorithmic process you want to measure, you can actually build it up yourself using what we call physical space building blocks or process building blocks. Now this sounds fancy, but it's literally lines and polygons drawn on a, co a camera screen. But what you can do with these lines and polygons uh, on a camera screen is actually build up a business logic to say, hey, 50 people entered the door, please let somebody know to deal, deal with these people. Or <clears throat> this room has been completely empty for the last uh, 20 minutes, turn off the lights. We don't do the turn off the lights part. We give you the information that you should turn off the lights. This is an example of a retail space, basically, and how our sensors are set up. So in this case, uh, the user story or the algorithmic process is how many people walk in the center aisle of the shopping center versus how many turn in, how many go into the um, uh, coffee area there, what's the efficiency there, should I hire more people, should I remove desks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> one of the coolest things we've done, just to show you why a tool like this needs to be extremely flexible, is at an airport. So <clears throat> this is an airport in our region. Um, where the customer actually wanted to use a camera they had, an existing camera, to start measuring the efficiency of aircraft operations. So when an aircraft comes in, um, how long does refueling take? How long does um, um, the luggage take? How long uh, do people uh, on board uh, and dis disembark? When does the plane actually get pushed away from the gate? <clears throat> One might think this is not um, a physical space problem, that this is more of a, uh, I don't know, a business process optimization or some sort of corporate uh, optimization policy, but it's a physical space like any other. And actually, in order to measure this, you need to look at all the cameras leading up to that plane as well, or, or the, all the areas leading up to that plane as well. With this, this is what the customer basically received. Um, detailed reporting, refueling took 21 minutes, boarding took a minute, so this was just the pilot, uh, and the aircraft was basically pushed back from the gate. Um, another plane came in an hour and a half later, refueling took 17 minutes, boarding took seven minutes, so this actually had people going into it. This allows them to actually go in and change every single process that they need to reduce the amount of cost um, uh, that the aircraft is spending at the gate, basically. A couple of other things uh, that our data can be used for. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we've very often been used to is to understand like waiting times and how many people are queuing and stuff like that. It's not a use case I particularly like because, again, telling somebody the queues or waiting times are long on its own doesn't really have a lot of effect. So it's... <laughs> more on what you should do there, but still, you need to measure the process. Um, <clears throat> retail stores use us to understand if product placement is, is okay. Um, again, it, it's a very controversial topic on whether this is good or not, but at the same time, uh, cluttered environment is also something that, 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 that we feel shouldn't exist. And the most common thing that our platform gets used for is reduction of energy and uh, air conditioning uh, use, so HVAC. So 
we have cameras uh, in large skyscrapers in Canada that are doing exactly this. If a room goes empty, I need to switch off air conditioning in this floor that much earlier. And of course, this data can then be uh, applied with um, predictive machine learning to understand, does this happen every week? Does this happen every other Tuesday? Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing which I think is really cool, uh, peak hour analysis. So this is a company that owns two uh, retail stores. And what they did was that they actually had people come in, measure by hand uh, when is the peak hour of both stores. They figured out it was around 6 o'clock in the evening. Uh, and they did all their staffing based on that. What that means is that they had the most amount of people working at 6 o'clock. Um, <clears throat> when we came in, we started measuring all of this uh, data 24-7. And what we found out was that this company doesn't have a peak hour. What this graph basically shows on the line is when the peak hour is, and on the, uh, the bar chart is how many people come in during peak hour. So the peak hour goes from 10 a.m. to like 6 p.m. from day to day, completely randomly, which means that they were constantly either understaffed or overstaffed. Mm. Um, again, it shows you that if you measure a snippet of uh, time in a physical space, you might miss up out a lot of data, basically. All right, um, so flexibility. So far, what, why, why I'm saying that the platform needs to be flexible is that you need to be able to describe this algorithmic process in a digital form so that you can measure it properly. Another thing that you need to be able to do is um, measure almost any object, right? Because yes, it's, it's very easy to measure people, it's very easy to, easy to measure cars, if you go into specific other objects, they can get really hard in terms of computer vision. So what we now do is we actually uh, can create a computer vision model to detect any object in less than two days. And we use generative AI to do that, basically. So the aircraft uh, model you saw, or aircraft um, operations model you saw was a completely synthetic model, which means that it had no images uh, that were actually taken from the real world. And by synthetic model, I mean um, what we do here is we take 10 images of objects that we need to detect. We generate around um, 10,000 images uh, per class there using uh, DALI 3, Midjourney 2, all these type of things. We then label those images using the segment anything model, convert the segments into uh, bounding boxes so that we can actually have automatic labeling done. Um, then remove every uh, object that actually doesn't look like the key object that we're trying to detect and we have our, our own similarity algorithms to do that. So this entire process of generating a synthetic data set is fully automatic basically for us at this point. Um, this goes into training. We end up with a model like this which sucks, if I'm honest. Um, the mean average precision on this one is around 50% uh, at a confidence of 95%. So <clears throat> actually, uh, the ve so this is a, a graph of uh, mean average precision, so how, how accurate the model is. The very first synthetic model is that, that lowest line there. But what end up, ends up happening there is that we put this model live, it starts collecting data from the real world environment, and we start switching up the synthetic data where we actually reach an accuracy rate of around 95%, uh, 85%, 85%, I'm getting old, uh, at a confidence rate of 95. Um, and that's a very good model, basically. So we end up having a fully synthetic model of a completely new object that trains itself into a uh, non-synthetic model within a week, basically. So this is an active learning loop that we have created. Um, and um, <clears throat> yeah, this is basically now, I think we have around six or seven models like this, operational. Uh, it doesn't work with uh, very specific things. So if you want to uh, detect the Toyota Corolla, no. You can detect a car. Uh, and you can detect a tire, but you can't go very specific on this. But if you need to detect the rudder of a cruise liner, that you can do. So this is basically uh, 
the end result of that. And that is a live uh, model, uh, none of which has been, none of this video has been used to train the model, basically. And finally, I mean, it wouldn't be a data science seminar if we didn't talk about chat GPT. Um, <clears throat> one of the problems we were having was that all of this data here uh, needs to be accessed by our customers as well, right? Um, one of the key things that we are known for is that we focus a lot on data privacy. We were one of the first companies who uh, started talking to the Estonian Data Protection Authority when we were building our products, first startups, I'm sorry, um, to make sure that if a customer wants to use FIMA, no lawyers need to get involved. Um, so when we found, I mean, when ChatGPT came out first, we figured, okay, this is an awesome tool. You know, let's create a chatbot, let's connect our entire database to, to it and just have our customers ask questions about it. Well, we don't want to be sending any data to OpenAI, right? Because even though our, all of our physical movement data is uh, completely anonymous, we still don't want to be sending any movement data to a company that's creating like bleeding edge AI algorithms, right? So what we ended up doing was actually uh, creating our own integrations to um, ChatGPT, which basically became a glorified query engine. So if a, question, if a person asks a question, how many cars drove past this line yesterday, what ChatGPT does is it basically creates a query into our database. So, um, and then the, that data is actually being fed to the end user. So no user data gets sent to anybody else. But it created basically a chatbot that I think seven years ago would have taken two years to build, and we did it in a week. That's, that's the power of this, basically. Any questions? I think you, you gave too much information. I have no reaction yet. <laughs> I, I did not, uh, th thank you for your presentation. I did not quite get uh, the um, open AI versus private uh, model. So, so which model, which language model did you use? We used uh, ChatGPT's language model, right? We used uh, uh, GPT 3.5 to do this. But not in-house installation. Uh, we did send the queries. We, we, we basically, um, um, so if a person asks a question. Uh, you said that you're, you don't want to send the data there, but in, you, in fact you did. No, we sent the question here, and what op we sent the question here and asked ChatGPT to create a query. database query. So that the database... You, you hit the, that database query. To open AI, and then... Uh, uh, no, that database query went into our database and gets fed into our front end. So that the movement data that's actually being shown to the user is never sent to open AI. The only thing that gets sent is like sensor names, camera names, stuff that's necessary to do the query. So, so to comment, it's like you have a live developer, so you tell him... Kind of. Every time, you ask, it, then every time you ask a question, it creates its own integration, okay. kind of. I have a question with Artie. Hi. Uh, in previous presentations, previous data science seminars, we have heard that uh, OpenAI does about 95, maybe if you're lucky, 99% of the queries um, that you want to get in a correct format. Yeah. So do you get uh, badly formatted queries out of your questions? Yes, we do. Uh, so this is, uh, so th there are a couple of ways to solve this. First off is that because what we're, what we're asking it to create is code, we can always validate if that code is correct before it gets sent to the uh, database. We can also validate if all the necessary parameters are correct and exist. Things like uh, sensor names, things like camera ID, IDs, stuff like that. So we do get a lot of hallucinations, but we throw them away. And we used to kind of set, ask, ask the user to uh, try again, but then we kind of just uh, had a loop written into it so it would try multiple times. And if you're developing something like this, testing is fun, trust me. Because uh, testing actually, when we started testing this, if you ask a question for it once and validate the results, you have to ask the same question 60 times to see if it makes a mistake and how often it makes a mistake. So our QA teams actually had to come up with a completely new process of how to validate this stuff. 
But now GPT-4 allows to output in certain formats that uh, that you want, right? Then yeah. you new release. Yeah. So now yeah. it shouldn't be a problem, or it's still. It's a problem? not. A, it's not a problem uh, that much anymore. Yeah. This was uh, done during the Langchain days. So now OpenAI has their own connectors, basically. Any other questions? I think we have one up there. Just gonna put this away. Hi, thank you so much for a fascinating presentation. I have two questions. Uh, one question is regarding the data sources. Uh, could you please talk more about what type of the data you can collect? Because you mentioned you have cameras and you use some mobile cameras. So do you have another sources for any other types, not only video probably that you work with? And the second question regarding the roadmap. As you mentioned that you work with data collection, analysis, some insights, and do you have also planning for this part for decision-making process for some automation for the, the next steps, what you can do with the data? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so the first question around data sources, right now, uh, we only process uh, the video streams that we or our customers put into the platform. So there are ongoing discussions on whether we should add in cell phone data, weather data, which I really hate because, yeah, that's a different ballgame. Um, but, uh, but right now it's only uh, video stream anal analytics, basically. Uh, now, that being said, there are like about around 2 billion data points of collected data as of today on the final platform. So there's a lot of this type of data. And there are metadata tags attached to it. So whether it's indoor, outdoor, uh, what type of environment it is, stuff like that. So you can do certain types of analytics on it uh, already. The second question you asked is very good because that's exactly where we want to go. So we want to be able to actually tell you what to do as well, not just be the analytics company that shows you the data. That is uh, more difficult to, to do than to kind of say. <laughs> so. Um, and that is something that we have to approach vertical specific because something that a city might want is completely useless to a business park. So that, that's kind of where we're at at the moment. So we'll take one question. Yeah, please. Yes. Uh, thank you for the talk um, about this uh, chat chip integration. How do you stop um, the questions giving away the information? So let's say I ask how many people entered the shop. The system tells 1,000. Now, my next question is, out of these 1,000 people, how many were children? And then OpenAI knows that the answer was 1,000. So do you have some filtration, filter out these sort of uh, questions that give away data, or how do you yeah. deal with these uh, kind of cases? No, we don't. And we have disclaimers in the contract. This is an experimental feature as of today. So if you want to use this as a customer, you need to kind of sign, an N, not an NDA, but an agreement on that. But that's a good point. Uh, you can't. We even have situations where if we opened up this to our customers, uh, because this is a paid license, our customers started using this as chat GPT. You know, write this email to my customer, right? I mean, literally, that's what happened. So it, it shows us that these types of like... Uh, AI chatbots, even if they're attached to our product, we built it to give information about our product. They're still going to use it exactly the same way that they would any open AI product. Can we stop them doing that from that? No. Right? So whose responsibility is it to keep uh, not sending this type of data to, um, uh, to open AI? That being said, it's their data. So one of the, another policy of FIMA is that we don't uh, own the data that we collect the customers who collect data through our platform owns the data. So if they do that, that's on them. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Tavi. Thank you very much. I think it's, uh, it's time for some refreshment. So we'll take a small break of half an hour. Uh, so please, outside there is yeah. drinks and something to eat. Enjoy it, and then we will be back in 30 minutes. Thank you. Um, so we'll come back again. I, I hope that you enjoyed your little bit of refreshment, um, and then we'll continue again on our second session. Um, so now we'll have uh, Aga Pon, who's uh, from Human Geography, um, and also she's the head of uh, Mobility Labs, um, and her research are focused on human environment interaction urban geography, human mobility, and sustainability science. Uh, so the topic is really, really interesting today. So we'll see 
the, the aspect of health and sustainability in, uh, in uh, urban mobility. And I think we will give the floor to Aga and we'll see the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Amnir. And uh, hello to everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. So, um, indeed, I'm going to talk about today about um, the spatial data analytics, spatial data types, and spatial data uh, approaches uh, that we need in order to understand uh, the sustainable mobility in our urban areas, and also the ways how to improve the quality of our cities uh, so that they could be more human scale, more healthy, and supportive, uh, supporting active uh, mobility. The mobility of our societies is changing, and it has been changing over the decades. We know that we live in a society in which car-oriented planning has been the dominant planning approach since the Second World War, which has then resulted in the cities uh, which are also dominated by cars, surprisingly, uh, which, which have flown across the borders, we know suburbanization occurs, and as, make, as using cars has been made so easy, so prominent, the first choice that we could have, it also means that, that we can live further away from our daily destinations, like workplaces or schools, or where our friends live, because we know that we can anytime take the car and reach our destination where we want to go. Uh, and more and more people in our societies want to live in the urban areas. We know that urbanization is still continuously on increase globally uh, and also in Estonia, uh, which means that more and more people want to reach the destinations in the cities by their individual cars, taking more and more space uh, for transport infrastructure, which is oriented for cars. Uh, and there are several these kind of uh, aspirations uh, uh, that, we, that we can't get rid of the use of the cars, while at the same time, this use of the cars or motorized vehicles and fossil fuels has also led to the climate crisis, as we know. It has also led to the ecosystem loss, because we use land for other purposes than let them to be for urban uh, or green and blue infrastructure and ecosystems. Uh, and, uh, and this has put us thinking more and more that which are the cities where we actually want to live? Which are the cities that are actually good for our health, uh, for our communities, uh, for our resource use, for the impacts uh, uh, that our action uh, leaves? During the pandemic, we, we saw that abrupt changes in social mobility are actually possible. We had a huge live social experiment uh, during the pandemic. We, we had a lot of mobility restrictions. We started to use a lot more active travel modes, be more in the vicinity of our home locations. Uh, and that the pandemic period also meant that our cities went through quite influential urban um, interventions or street space interventions. And what has remained from that is that, for example, we have a lot more bike lanes in our urban areas. At the same time, the drop in, in fossil fuels or in drop in motorized traffic that occurred has now stopped, and motorized traffic use is again on, on huge or immense rise. So the, the gains that we got during the pandemic in, in urban mobility are by now gone. Although we have declared globally or, or um, throughout different nations in the world that we want to actually pursue sustainability. We have defined 17 sustainable development goals. We have Green Deal in Europe. Uh, a lot of technologies, a lot of businesses are working on that, that how to make also our human or our urban mobility more sustainable. We want to have human scale cities. We want to socialize on the streets. We want to feel ourselves safe on the streets. We want our kids to go to schools independently, yet we, we feel that it is too unsafe and we better take them to the school by cars, creating even more car use, creating, uh, demanding even further space uh, for urban mobility. So we see that there are those individual and public interests that collapse. 
We don't want to give away our privileges. We don't give away our comfort. We don't want to give away our short time use. Uh, so we, use, we want to have the right to use our cars, but at the same time, we want that the cities are human scale, healthy, sustainable, pleasant for all and safe. And of course, we want that the cities um, would provide equal opportunities for all communities, all kinds of social groups, regardless of their age, their gender, their, their ethnicity, uh, their socioeconomic background, their social status, their physical disabilities, etc., etc. And we want the cities to be healthy, not that the city environments and the mobility environments in which we move would lead us uh, to, or, or lead the populations to increase morbidity and mortality rates. Yet we see that the car use is on increase. It's on constant increase um, in Tartu, which this, uh, this part is about. So in Tartu, um, the uh, pedestrian uh, travel mode share has decreased over the decades, as it has all over Estonia, and car use has gained space in, in the modal split. We know that in Estonia, on the right-hand side figure, in general, um, car use, people that use car at least four times per week form 51% 50, of the whole population. And this, this is the prominent uh, travel mode that we use in, in daily life. We see that in Europe, th these are figures from Eurostat. Uh, the the left-hand side figure is from 2011, and the right-hand hand side figure is uh, from 2020. They look pretty much the same, and they reflect the, the personal private car use in modal, uh, modal share when compared to buses and trains. No walking, no cycling is included in here. But, but look at, for one moment, at legends. This is a visualization trick that is made with cartographic visualization. The range of the scale is totally different. It was 59% in 2011, and it is 73% in 2020. So the color scale just tricks, tricks us, but actually the car use has been on a severe increase during only one decade. So in the mobility lab, we work a lot on the human, uh, human mobility research from different angles and human mobility behavior, travel behavior, why we do uh, travel decisions as we do. And uh, one part of the research is also what is the role of our travel environments in our daily travel choices, our daily travel decisions, and hence, what does it mean for our health, for our uh, uh, social well-being, and the, the opportunities or the equity of opportunities that different social groups have. You probably recognize this, this street space. It's just over there, uh, across Emayagi, it's Emaya Street. And you may, you may also think about the quality of this street space. So whether it is pedestrian friendly, whether it is cycling friendly, whether you would feel safe there, how you would feel yourself there if there is extreme heat, a heat wave coming, for example. Does the architecture provide you some impulses? Would you stop and talk to your friend if you saw the friend on the, on the street? when you walk there, walk on that street? Or would you let your kid go alone to school during the, on this kind of a street? And even if that street might feel nice, not all streets are as nice, and our daily, tra daily travel routes consist of different stretches on different types of streets, and this as a whole build up our travel experience. Furthermore, the conditions here that we see are not constant in time. This, this image is taken during the daytime. But imagine yourself walking there uh, during the nighttime, where there is no one, no other person moving, for example. Or imagine yourself moving there tomorrow morning, when it's more likely going to look like that. And it might be a bit slippery, and perhaps your, your walking pace is a bit different, and Perhaps some people having physical disabilities would not feel themselves so easy or 
than walking on that street. So there is also dynamics involved in the conditions of our street spaces, of our environmental conditions, or, or, or our street environments. And the dynamics can be temporal, as we see here, throughout the seasons, throughout the daily rhythms. It can be spatial, because we have different types uh, of environments at different locations. So we try to, so what is, what is really difficult in this kind of research is to capture these dynamics and, and um, characterize the dynamics in data so that we can run analyses throughout uh, different timescales and throughout different spaces and then overlay these kind of environmental data sets with human mobility data. And the human mobility data, surprise, is also dynamic because people move throughout the space, they don't only stand at one spot, the flows differ during different times uh, and at different uh, areas, uh, people move on for different reasons and in different magnitudes. So walking through urban street spaces uh, is a multi-sensory experience. We see the space around us, we, f we feel the, the smells, which may be perhaps bakery, or perhaps uh, a glimpse of early spring. But perhaps air pollution and dust, which comes from the roads. We feel the temperature, we hear the sounds, and the sounds might also be both pleasant or neutral, or perhaps have some adverse effects. Typically, when we think about sounds in travel spaces, we think about travel noise or traffic noise. But there might also be birdsong, and this birdsong might be quite nice. And perhaps we want some more bird songs in our, in our streets. So studying this environmental exposure in, in travel environments or during travel is a complex uh, analytical task. It involves a lot of um, dynamics, complexity. Individuals who pass are different. Um, they have different background characteristics, preferences, sensitivity to environmental hazards, vulnerability, etc. The opportunities that we have, access to healthy travel routes, for example, is different. The travel services and the infrastructure is different. We, we as communities, uh, live in different locations in, in our urban areas. Our urban areas are very often segregated, and different population groups, different communities, have access to different types of urban travel environments, different types of urban tra transport infrastructure and mobility services. So, in this environmental exposure uh, research, we follow the activity space approach, which means that we want to capture the dynamics in time, and the dynamics in space, and the dynamics in different uh, environmental conditions that are there. And perhaps only not environmental conditions, but also the social conditions and the social environments people are exposed to when they move through the urban space. And the activity space then consists of the activity locations, where we are right now, for example, or the travel routes, if we move through uh, the urban space. It can, uh, uh, we can talk about momentary locations, here and now, we can talk about routine travel behavior, uh, which we do like habitually, over and over, over time. And we may talk about life course mobility and life course exposures. And these are especially important for health effects and, uh, and um, population level, level epidemiologics. So, <coughs> I've run an, uh, a review on the, on the state of the art of environmental exposure research uh, which addresses specifically travel time. Uh, and what we see from there, that this kind of dynamics is, on, is emerging in this research field. Both uh, the conditions of the environment, as well as the locations of people, are more and more tracked in a dynamic manner with GPS, uh, yeah, uh, uh, GPS, uh, whatever, sensors, smartphones, for example, or different portable sensors that we uh, gather with us in order to uh, monitor noise pollution or air quality or temperature. Or different biosensors that we can have on our wrist 
uh, that, that can uh, monitor our heart rate variability, our stress levels, our physical activity uh, uh, rates. Uh, and we see that the, the research field is moving beyond the traditional top-down like land cover analytics or an analysis or and data collection uh, methods. Uh, yet, we don't know very much about the outcomes, short-term outcomes or, or longitudinal chronic outcomes. Yet, we don't, uh, uh, don't know very much uh, about low- and middle-income countries because the research has been conducted mostly in the Netherlands, in the United States, in Canada, in uh, now currently in China, and increasingly in India. So we even don't know a lot about Europe, European countries. And we don't know that, that how people perceive it, uh, perceive the environments, because one thing is to monitor it and, and really collect data very objectively, and the other thing is that to understand how people understand that, that whether it is important for people cognit in a cognitive uh, way. And so we ask, how, how can spatial data and spatial tools help us uh, to address these issues? And what have we done about that? And in this section now, I've briefly run through, or quickly run through um, our, our uh, projects, or our activities and data sets that we have prepared in order to disentangle those issues. Uh, and these are done both here at the University of Tartu, as well as at the University of Helsinki, at the Digital Geography Lab, where I did my postdoc, and I returned from the postdoc two years ago. So some of the papers are from that time. So for example, this spring, uh, our master student, Aisha Yusibova, uh, graduated, and she prepared different street uh, network data sets of the environmental conditions that we have from raster data or vector data. So these are, for example, about particular matter 2.5 or, or NO2, like air quality uh, measures, or about street level greenery using remote sensing satellite imagery, NTVI indicator from there, or then noise, which is uh, gained from noise modeling. Another master student of ours created another type of, of green view index of the street space, and this time in Tartu. And this used Google Street View images. And she did this image segmentation and uh, identified the level of greenery or, uh, or the share of greenery in those images. And those data sets are publicly available uh, in our UT GitLab. Or Git, yeah, GitLab, not GitHub. Another research we made is, a, is a, war, or was about comparing human perception of urban street space, greenery, uh, with the objectively measured uh, indicators. And the objectively measured uh, uh, greenery rates were gathered either via uh, image segmentation or point, point cloud-based methods, or then this is the same remote sensing satellite imagery, or then very, very classical topographic maps. And we see that humans uh, tend to overestimate the amount of greenery in their uh, surrounding, surrounding environment, and that the different methods can reflect human perception at different rates. Uh, in, in this very same building, uh, a year ago, I ran a, an eye tracking experiment uh, where I then checked how people perceive street space imagery when they are. Um, when there are played different sounds, traffic noise and bird songs. And if in the imagery there is different, different levels of vegetation and there are different seasons uh, in, from the same locations. And we see that people perceive themselves better if they think that there, are, there is more greenery in the image and also if there is more greenery in the Im image as calculated, also the perception rates are higher. And if they, if they hear bird song, they actually also tend to put attention to uh, trees in the images or urban green spaces in, in the images, while if they hear traffic sound, they don't notice the greenery that much. So how to improve the travel time exposure? So this is a study from Helsinki with bike share trip data, where we routed people on the real bike share trips through the urban space across different routes, shortest route and exposure optimal routes. And we see that, especially in the case of traffic noise, 
the root choice matters significantly, and we can reduce, indeed, a lot of the exposure that we perceive on route. While if there is no greenery on streets, then it doesn't matter whether we take a route on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side, we still no, don't experience any greenery. So the basic conditions need to provide us the good uh, exposure, the good street space uh, quality uh, from the first hand. And we ran this uh, analysis by using the Green Path, so Path software that we also developed uh, during the project. And this is both in use for, for research mode, for massive uh, queries, as well as for end users, uh, so that you can go and use it via your smartphone and check which are, which are the paths which have the lowest air, quality, air pollution or the lowest traffic noise level or the most greenery. And my colleague Antawasa sitting there has prepared those, those maps about Tallinn, um, people living in Tallinn, in Kalamaja and Priisle region. Uh, this is the data collected uh, by a, a smartphone application that our lab has developed called Mobility Log. Uh, and uh, this was a lot about social segregation in activity spaces, this, this research project. But if we overlay the mobility data that we have gathered through this uh, research project, we can also say something about the social disparities in environmental exposure in activity space. We can compare the ethnic groups, gender groups, social statuses, etc. And in geography, we want to understand the exposures both on the individual level, as when we, when we talk about those GPS data sets, for example, and what does it mean for people, how people perceive it, and whether they get ill or they feel good. But we also want to make generalizations over population groups and over uh, spatial areas. So we want to reach these. We want to understand how our urban spaces function uh, as a whole. So, in order to answer those questions, the work is only ongoing uh, and, uh, and we cannot provide very substantial results uh, yet on Estonian population or the people in Tartu. But we know that, that spatial data availability and mobility data availability and health or individual data availability is crucial for making those uh, analyses and, and reaching results which can also inform our spatial planning and, and uh, decision making. We know that the, role, uh, that the travel environment quality affects the well-being of pedestrians uh, and it can also then uh, affect the travel choices that we do. Um, and advances in different sensor technology, for example, attaching um, portable sensors to city bikes, the bike share bikes, uh, could also provide us real environmental data about the locations where really, where really have been, because people have biked those environments. And if you then collect data along those routes at the times people were there, at the height people were and heard and, and smell and, um, and breath uh, air pollution, we can also make quite huge generalizations um, of the quality of the Tartu uh, urban area. And novel data and tools, open research practices, allow the replicability uh, of these kind of studies across different urban areas. Uh, but we also require or need common research protocols and standardized practices to actually provide comparable uh, results. And we hope that our research feeds into policy and uh, spatial decision making, and that's why we also strongly or intensively co collaborate uh, with our public uh, municipalities. Further reading, and this work cannot be done alone. The work uh, is complemented and, and, and the uh, research infrastructure is provided by our mobility lab, about several master students and collaborators uh, from elsewhere, most notably from the uh, Digital Geography Lab, University of Helsinki. And next summer at Mobile Tartu Conference, we will certainly talk more about those issues. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Aga. So now we'll open the floor for questions.
Thanks, Sagar. Um, you mentioned uh, having some sort of cooperation with the local municipalities, but uh, like, there's a lot of data here, a lot of things to present. And I'll bring up one example. Everyone knows how you know traffic noise is bad, air pollution is bad, but how do you try drive home that point to the local municipalities that, hey, we have this kind of issue, it could be solved in this way. How do you foster that kind of, I don't know, data culture and data-driven decision-making uh, with the stakeholders? Thanks for the question. We will ask the same question um, from our municipality representatives at Next Nobel Tartu, for example, and we continuously ask them also, so how can we collaborate? How, like, what kind of data are you ready to get on board? So what is the type of data that can actually help you to make your decisions better? So, so we can provide different comparisons and, and, uh, and neighborhood level comparisons, population, like relate the data to aggregated population register data, etc. Uh, but we also need to understand that this needs to take, be taken on board in the planning process and the decision making process and also in the real implementation process, and these are all different compartments in the, in the municipalities. So uh, this is something that we very well know and we tackle it every day and, and we just try to push on a positive way uh, for the cities to take it on. Yeah. But, but what do you think? Uh, is there enough expertise at the moment on the level of local municipalities to actually accept this kind of data and uh, what has been the impact so far? Uh, yeah. Um, I can tell about Helsinki, so they really have taken that on board and they have uh, they have very much like acknowledged that this is an issue and when we develop new areas or when we do run street interventions or when we do major street reconstructions, we need to ensure uh, that, the, that the streets have the greenery so that first they have a canopy tree canopy, which is high, which um, uh, leverages the heat wave issue uh, and provides shade, so it doesn't allow the, those heat islands to develop in the first place. They know that they have to um, redesign, reallocate the street space to different uh, types uh, of, uh, of movers or pedestrians and cyclists and bus lanes and cars, and if not possible, and they bring them to the joint space, then the speeds are very, very low and everyone can walk on the pedestrian or cyclist. Uh, speed. Um, so so they, they have taken this kind of information on board uh, to run their decisions um, on, on different levels. And the general knowledge, I think, is there also in Estonia, and, and we see also our local municipalities driving that vision. Thanks. Thanks. We have a couple of questions. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, from my side, I just wanted to ask, um, probably already to, to proceed with the previous question. So, and given the city is not uh, doing all of the good policies, and uh, what would be your recommendation for me as a social responsible citizen who wants to uh, apply as a methodology on his own and find these routes uh, the best way? As this is very complex methodology to to proceed or. Are there any uh, like available tools for uh, any end user to, to look mm. for um, or to, to build, to try to, to like comprehend how to better build mm. the routes? So, yeah, thank you. Yes, like the very general, like the, the first, you have just have to acknowledge that this is an issue. And, and your daily routes actually affect your well-being, like in the way that you do not understand because it's physical, because it just affects your pulmonary system, your cardiovascular system, etc. So, and, and if you then think when you walk, okay, is, the, is this a good path? Or perhaps another path is better, then take the other path. So, first of all, <laughs> you can like very simply trust on your own senses, but you have to take a bit more time and you just have to think about that. Put your attention. So I think that this is the, the very first thing. And the Green Path tool in, in Helsinki, which is a pilot, it really is a very simple, very, very super simple tool, and, and which just provides you different routes and then uh, tells you, okay, this is the best in terms of air pollution, this is the best in terms of noise, and you can make your own choice. So, so what do you prefer? Uh, and it is for cycling and walking. 
So, and uh, it has also open code, so, so please come and develop it in, in Tartu, in Tallinn, elsewhere as well, so it is possible. But for, from the first uh, phase, I think that just follow your, in, <laughs> yeah, your own feeling. Was there yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you also collaborate with, uh, let's say, toxicologists or representatives of uh, this sort of biochemical fields to turn, let's say, the pollution levels to some sort of indices that are more comprehensible, let's say. So, let's say we have acute toxicity, we have chronic toxicity of uh, pollutants, and actually the concentration of, uh, let's say, hydrogen dioxide in the air, it doesn't tell us too much. Let's say if there are children in there, they may be more prone mm. to some uh, mm. toxic effects than adults. Yeah. If I'm inside a car, maybe I drive through this pocket faster. Yeah. Uh, so all these kind of coefficients come into play and um, I feel that they should be accounted mm. for, but I actually don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so it's also a matter of whether you run like low scale individual level uh, level studies and then you can actually capture also different individual sensitivity levels. So whether this person belongs to a, a risk group, etc. And, and then there are population level uh, studies which, run, which are done or which follow the environmental epidemiological uh, research field and where health research come into play or public health research has come into play. Uh, and, and of course the activity rate uh, uh, affects how much pollution you in inhale. So if you are more active, you inhale more po pollution. So as I said, that this individual, like the, the research field involves complexity and individual diversity uh, also in terms of sensitivity to environmental uh, like hazards can be different. And uh, if we like, if we are allowed to like combine these kind of data sets, or or if volunteers come to our small scale uh, sample studies, then we can do those, or together with health researchers, because we are geographers. <laughs> so together with health researchers, it is possible to do it, and it is done in the world. But then the generalizability level is is then another other issue. How can you then generalize it to to all social groups or all uh, throughout the space uh, over the whole urban area. So these kind of matters are there, and, and we we try to disentangle those uh, those uh, associations and interactions. Thanks. Thank all right. Thank you. Any other questions? No. All right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. So uh, I think we will move to our last speaker. So uh, we have uh, the pleasure to have uh, Anders uh, Seftruk from MIT. Um, so unfortunately, he couldn't be present here because he was flying to San Diego. But uh, we managed to, to get a glimpse for him uh, from uh, online. So just to introduce a little bit Anders. So he's an associate professor of uh, urban science and planning at MIT, um, where he's also leading the city form lab. So his research focuses on making cities more walkable, sustainable, and livable, and also bridging the field of urban design, special analytics, and mobility research. So Anders is also an author of uh, the Urban Network Analysis uh, Toolbox, uh, used by researchers and uh, practitioners around the world to model pedestrian uh, flows along city streets and to study coordinated uh, land use and transportation uh, development along networks. Uh, he has also recently published uh, a book entitled Street uh, Commerce, Creating Vibrant Urban Sidewalks uh, with the University of Pennsylvania Press. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anders, of, uh, for accepting the invitation. And uh, I think the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Amnir. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thanks for um, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks for convening this uh, group of interesting speakers. Um, let me see if I can get my slides shared. Okay. Um, so what I would like to share with you today is an, one specific ongoing project in my uh, research group uh, entitled uh, NYC Walks or New York City Walks. Um, this project is motivated like many other projects in our research group 
by several ongoing urban crises, uh, some of which Age already eloquently referred to. Decarbonization of cities has become a paramount topic for cities across the world, including the US and Estonia, and frankly, every continent. Unfortunately, the most dominant approach to urban decarbonization uh, in the mobility sector uh, tends to be a focus on electric vehicles uh, and some versions thereof, including uh, automated vehicles, transportation network companies like Uber, Taxify, Lyft, and so forth. Um, it's important to decarbonize urban mobility sector because it is the largest polluting sector of all, uh, contributing over a third of CO2 uh, emissions in industrialized economies and even a larger share in cities, uh, where it's typically around 40% of all emissions come from transportation sector. And most of that comes from single passenger vehicles. Uh, around 60 or two thirds of all of the transportation emissions are just regular um, people driving around. Now, addressing that crisis through EVs, AVs, and TNCs, I think, has a number of shortcomings. Uh, first and foremost, that it is a sort of singular approach to just address one specific issue at a time uh, without uh, trying to, through the same kind of strategy, address other related issues uh, in um, um, city development, such as decarbonization of buildings, which are intricately related to the decarbonization of mobility, because the kinds of buildings that we have in a city uh, intimately depend on the mobility mode. Um, if we have a city where everybody drives everywhere, we'll have lots of low rise, uh, large footprint um, buildings sprawling out. And if we have a high share of uh, public transit use, walking, cycling, and so forth, we'll have much higher density cities with much lower carbonization um, levels uh, coming from their heating, cooling, and um, energy systems. The other issue, of course, is that um, EVs, AVs, and TNCs tend to really currently address the high income uh, bracket of the population without really doing much for most ordinary people. So in our research group, um, we've decided explicitly to focus on walkable and transit-oriented cities, which do address um, almost everyone in society and which have the added benefit of directly addressing a number of important public policy concerns simultaneously, not just decarbonizing urban mobility, but also the building sector, addressing equity issues, addressing public health, addressing local economic development, and social issues as well. We think um, and are convinced that uh, aiming our efforts towards uh, urban data science that can support building walkable and transit-oriented cities uh, is a much better choice um, in addressing all of these concerns rather than uh, purely um, AVs and EVs. So why model pedestrian trips um, in cities? Um, as you may know, Pedestrian uh, counts are actually directly available in some locations, usually very select locations. In Tartu, I think there are some automated pedestrian counters. Uh, in some cities uh, like Melbourne, Australia, there's a whole network of them, about 100 uh, throughout the city center. And in some cities, they're just manually collected. However, that data doesn't reflect the majority of streets. It's only a small fraction of all streets where we know how many people walk there. As Aga was already alluding to, um, if we do not know what happens on city streets on foot, then we fail to communicate the importance of that when it comes to investment decisions. Like Jan Gehl likes to say, we must count what we care for. If we do not count the pedestrians, we do not care for them when it comes to public investment, uh, such as renovations and, and, and uh, public space improvements and so forth. So a model helps generalize the very few counts that are available in select locations to almost all streets in a city uh, and uh, develop an understanding of pedestrian volumes everywhere. Second, once we have information about pedestrian volumes, this can, becomes a very important input to improvements and investments. Typically, you would want to spend the scarce taxpayer euros in locations that benefit the most constituents or that benefit constituents that are in most need of these uh, improvements, such as 
population groups that are much more likely to walk than others. Um, third, pedestrian volumes can be a really critical uh, data point or data source for a lot of urban hazard information. So when we, for instance, talk about urban heat, noise, things uh, that Aga already alluded to, or traffic crashes, then it may be very important to have a denominator in these data sets. So if we know, for instance, where very hot places are during heat waves um, in, in intense summer periods, uh, it may be also in, equally important to be able to um, uh, identify where that heat is also affecting people who are actually on the street. So it may be less of a problem if it's a location where nobody's walking and much greater of a problem if it is a location um, that many people are exposed to. Same with traffic crashes, and I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, and finally, uh, perhaps most ambitiously and importantly, uh, the type of model that I'm going to introduce can be used to also forecast how planned infrastructure, land use, or urban design changes that cities permit and approve and go through can affect and desirably increase non-motorized mobility in cities such as New York. Uh, as you may have also noticed, cities around the world have signed on to climate pledges and a very important aspect of that typically is a mode shift. Um, even, even if you look at the Tartu uh, strategy report, uh, Tartu has very um, uh, ambitious targets to increase the level of walking and public transit use and cycling and reduce driving. As, um, as Aga uh, mentioned, that reality has been moving in the opposite trend. Um, and one of the reasons why I argue the reality is moving in the opposite trend is that we have decoupled land use decisions and urban design decisions from these mobility outcomes and metrics. Every time a city allows a new project to be built at a sprawling location outside of the city center, far away from any amenities or transit um, locations, is a tiny contribution to shifting the mode share needle in the wrong direction. So in order to actually achieve these policy targets that are in the city strategies, we must have methods to keep track project by project how day-to-day -day planning decisions contribute to the mode shift that we aim to achieve. So I'm going to describe briefly this model. Uh, in this case, the model is applied to New York City. We've actually done this model for a number of different cities, um, including Melbourne, um, recently Beirut, Lebanon, uh, Boston, US, Somerville, US, um, and uh, parts of Los Angeles. So the model involves really four key uh, processes, data assembly, initial flow estimation, calibration, and finally, uh, flow prediction. In New York, um, in order to develop the initial model, um, we um, chose to, to prepare and clean data um, around locations where we had a fairly high number of pedestrian counts uh, to calibrate the model against. So the red dots here on the map describe the locations where New York City has sent out people to count pedestrians on their intersections. Um, in the year, uh, pair of years in 2018, 2019, there was a total of 2,400 count locations across the city at different time periods. We selected about half of them, about a thousand of them, um, and then prepared um, a highly detailed uh, sidewalk network data set um, in the areas that buffer about a mile around these 1,000 count locations. Uh, the reason why we, we just did this subset of the city is that it was uh, simply um, uh, in, the, in the given time frame we had in this part of the process, unfeasible to do a detailed audit and clear um, cleaning of the entire sidewalk data, network data set um, of New York City. Um, the sidewalk network data set cleanup is a uh, really interesting computational challenge in its, uh, on its own, uh, something that um, computer scientists, I think, have a lot to contribute to. Um, oftentimes, sidewalk network data is very messy when you originally open it, including um, in places like um, OpenStreetMap uh, or other sources sometimes digitized directly from aerial imagery. Um, and automated cleanup procedures we've been working on help uh, turn this data into uh, a connected, topologically continuous, uh, routable network data set where we can 
model pedestrian trips over networks. The kinds of problems that you oftentimes see involve gaps um, in the networks, uh, poorly uh, uh, documented intersections and discontinuities, missing nodes where nodes should exist where, and, and therefore routes cannot be routed um, through such intersections. Uh, very messy uh, intersections, what we call knots, with lots of different vertices and so forth, all of which are kinds of things that need to be cleaned uh, for the network to be actually routable and usable. Um, I should also mention that the vast majority of cities around the world do not know anything about their sidewalks. Uh, we have, since the 1990s, uh, been collecting around the world digital information about roadways. Uh, this was actually catalyzed by an executive order under uh, President Clinton in the United States, which required that U.S. cities adopt a um, digital data standard and a shapefile format for documenting their um, built environment data sets, including road networks. And then private companies like Navtech and TomTom and others, and eventually Google, went around the world and documented roadways around the world. So when we do routing and spatial analysis on networks, 99.9% .9 of the time, we do it uh, and people do it over road networks. But that's not, unfortunately, how pedestrians can move and not accurately representing uh, their ability to get to places. So it's really important that we start equalizing these data and develop um, uh, municipal and eventually national and global data sets uh, of pedestrian networks that follow um, uh, high quality uh, standards and, and are continuous and usable for routing. And then um, once we had the networks for these study areas, we populated um, um, the networks with lots of different origin destination data points. This is just a couple of examples, um, home locations, uh, business amenities, job locations, schools and daycares, open spaces and parks, uh, public transit stations like metro stations, bus stops, and so forth. And then we use uh, software tools we've developed in our team to route pedestrian journeys over the respective networks. This is called the urban network analysis tool um, or network analysis approach. Uh, this is initially was developed as a GIS plugin, then eventually uh, as a plugin for Rhino 3D to make it more uh, available to practicing urban planners and urban designers. And this very fall, we're working on a release of an open Python library that automates um, pedestrian and cycling uh, routing uh, calculations in large scale on very large data sets uh, in a Python library. So how does it work? Um, take, for instance, the simple uh, example of one census block in New York City. Um, we don't actually represent a census block typically with a single centroid because it would arbitrarily kind of uh, position the trips on one single network segment. So rather what we do is we um, uh, split the census block into its street frontages and divide its uh, population count uh, by the number of street frontages it has. So in this case, four. And these become essentially the blue dots represent trip origins. In this case, I'm showing an example of trips going from homes to their nearest subway station in New York. The subway station happens to have two separate entrances on both sides of the street on 176th Street. So when we route trips, you see that they don't necessarily also go along the shortest routes. There is a, a route choice model in there that finds a number of different route alternatives people are likely to take. Uh, we can expand this to multiple subway destinations. So uh, rather than going just to the nearest stations, the same census block, the same people coming from homes can split their trip probabilities to various destinations that are available within a reasonable walk shed around their home. So there's a destination choice model in here that splits those trips based on uh, travel costs and destination attractiveness levels uh, and utilities. Um, and then we, when we do it citywide, we start seeing uh, one particular trip type. This is trips from homes to subway stops in the study areas where we have documented the street networks. And you can zoom into very specific areas and get a high um, level of detail uh, of how many pedestrians we estimate uh, walking um, on uh, every single street um, uh, sidewalk and, and crosswalk uh, and footpath in city parks as well 
for this particular type of trip. Um, then we, we, we do this all um, automatically. So I'm showing how, for instance, this new Python library called Medina uh, computes uh, pedestrian journeys over networks. Uh, the matrix or the sort of diamond graph on the left-hand side here illustrates the kind of connections we typically would put into the model. So trips between bus stops and parks, institutions and jobs, homes and bus stops, homes and places of worship, homes and amenities, and so forth. So there's lots of different OD pairs. Um, these OD pairs are described in a CSV file called pairings.csv, where we say which origins do we want to use, which destinations we want to use with what uh, model parameters that the user sets. Um, and then it's all run on a, a multi-core environment to uh, rapidly calculate these outcomes. And uh, they can now be done for entire metropolitan area scales with the new um, Python tools. So let me look at uh, in somewhat more detail some of the model assumptions uh, when we do perform routing. A lot of the work that has come, gone into urban network analysis um, tool development is grounded in and informed by pedestrian uh, uh, behavior literature. How do people actually behave? Uh, what sorts of routes to, do they prefer? How does route distance or time uh, diminish their likelihood to walk to the destinations? What kinds of destinations do they walk to and so forth? So one of the assumptions um, is that uh, there is a dis there's a distance decay effect that as the destinations are further away, people are assumed to be less likely to walk to those destinations. There's actually different ways of describing that decay. I'm showing here an exponential decay curve. Uh, oftentimes we also work with, a, work with a logistic decay curve where um, the destination uh, probabilities fall at an S curve, uh, depending on time or distance from uh, the origin. Uh, second, we generally do not assume that people walk the shortest route. Um, this is oftentimes a simplified assumption in many routing models using the Dijkstra algorithm. Uh, what we do is a lot more computationally costly, uh, but also very important. And we worked hard to optimize this to as efficient a calculation as possible. So we find between each origin destination pair, all reasonable routes that people can walk and then distribute the probabilities of these routes, um, either uh, assigning them all equal probability if we don't know anything about their characteristics, or if we do know something about their characteristics, then the probabilities follow the uh, perceived costs um, or, or qualities of the different um, routes. Uh, it is known from route choice literature um, that all sorts of route characteristics can influence people's route choice on foot. Uh, same goes for cyclists, et cetera. Most commonly um, named factors include um, traffic volume, traffic speeds, the presence of ground floor amenities like street facing retail or restaurant or um, cultural businesses, sidewalk dimensions, even things like the sense of enclosure, how much sky you can see from the street or how much does the street feel like a canyon, uh, green cover like Aga was already alluding to, um, and things also like the um, uh, number of turns that the route involves, which is um, a cognitive metric that describes how complex a route is um, and how many intersections it might also involve um, walking over. Um, and a really interesting aspect of route choice models, which we also do in our research group, is that uh, when we have a discrete choice model, what's oftentimes referred to as multinomial uh, path choice logit model, uh, we can deduct or estimate how each route characteristic uh, is perceived as equivalent to distance. So for instance, uh, if we look at the elevation gain factor, so uh, when a route involves walking uphill, in the San Francisco study that we did a couple of years ago, we estimate that every one meter rise of going uphill is perceived as equivalent to the walk feeling like 3.8 meters longer in top of the actual distance walked, keeping everything else constant. Uh, one, per, one turn along the route is a very costly effect. In San, in San Francisco, a typical pedestrian uh, uh, feels like a route that has an additional turn is about 60 meters longer uh, uh, cognitively uh, and reduces their willingness to walk by that much. And some aspects are positive on the other hand. For instance, when you look at uh, the ground-facing amenities like uh, retail businesses, 
uh, passing 10 extra amenities makes the route feel like it's 18 meters shorter in San Francisco. So basically, if we take these willingness to walk coefficients that we can estimate from route choice models, we can then put them into a predictive model uh, using the same uh, urban network analysis framework. So for instance, for the same origin destination pair I showed earlier, if we know that the environmental characteristics of one particular route that I've highlighted in a dashed line are far superior, just imagine that this is a pedestrian only uh, route that is entirely safe and pleasant to walk, then we can include what rather than um, we can include what we call perceived costs for each network segment rather than the objective or geometric costs or time costs that are objectively measured in terms of speed. These perceived costs take into account these individual route um, uh, willingness to walk factor that I showed in the previous slide, and they can account for a whole range of different qualities of the route, traffic levels, uh, sidewalk dimensions, the presence of amenities, greenery, sky views, um, noise, um, street furniture, and so forth. And if those are indeed far uh, superior on uh, a particular route, then also the routing model uh, will route more trips down those paths because they have a lower cost for a pedestrian. They, they are perceived as lower cost. Um, um, fourth, in terms of model assumptions, oftentimes in pedestrian journeys, just like with any other kind of journeys, uh, we don't know exactly where people would go for a particular type of trip, and there's a number of different destinations available. For instance, if you consider somebody walking to lunch from an office location um, during the lunch period, there may be five, 10, maybe even uh, 150 different restaurants or eating places available a person could go to. So we do basically a destination choice model in the UNA tools where we use the Huff um, destination choice model, which basically uh, allocates a higher probability of trips to destinations that are more attractive, characterized by some numeric weight, and those that are also uh, 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 more proximate or more accessible in terms of travel costs. So the lower the travel cost, the higher the probability, and the higher the attractiveness, the higher the probability too. So we can, uh, for each type of trip, like I showed with subway stops earlier, uh, route trips to a number of available destinations and split those probabilities um, um, uh, depending on how close the destinations are and how attractive the destinations are. So how does this all pan out? Um, I showed earlier one type of trip, but then we can repeat this automatically for all sorts of trips. So this is trips from amenities to amenities. The second one is trips from homes to amenities. Third one is from homes to jobs, homes to metro stations, homes to parks, homes to schools, jobs to amenities, jobs to metro stations, and so forth. Um, these are all different trip types. And if you think about trying to understand the totality of foot traffic that happens in a city during a particular time period, like the evening peak period, let's say, then that totality of foot traffic is made up of lots and lots of different individual trip types. Now, we don't try or even care to estimate every possible trip type. That's generally unnecessary because around you know half a dozen or a dozen trip types explain the vast majority of what goes on in a city street. You'll have, of course, other people doing something very special. Somebody's walking their dog or somebody's, um, uh, I don't know, uh, going to the post office. Uh, those types of trips, of course, exist, but we typically don't model them because they are, represent a small minority of all trips. And we focus on the, the largest trip types that explain the biggest um, share of foot traffic in city streets. Now, these, I should also highlight that these individual trip type estimates in of themselves can be quite important and valuable. For instance, we can estimate most likely routes to schools for children, most likely routes to uh, transit stations, most likely routes to parks and amenity clusters like main streets, which directly can inform where you would want to place um, taxpayer euros for public investments. Where do you want to enlarge or improve public spaces and sidewalks? Where do you want to create the safest crossing so that kids can get to schools uh, uh, without being exposed to excessive traffic dangers? Um, but these are uncalibrated estimates so far. 
So in the next step, we calibrate these estimates against actual pedestrian counts on city streets. Uh, in this study for New York, we had uh, over a thousand uh, counts on weekdays um, and uh, about 500 or 450 uh, on weekends to calibrate, calibrate the model against. So we set the actual count as a dependent variable and these estimated trip types that I showed as predictors or independent variables. Um, we've done this usually with both uh, classical statistical linear models and more recently we, we tend to use machine learning models for this process uh, for two key reasons. Um, one is that uh, there's a, a great deal of multicollinearity in these data. So if you think about trips from jobs to transit stations and homes to transit stations, they go over the same network and to the same destination. And therefore, the trips are very collinear with each other, which violates one of the regression assumptions in linear models, and the machine learning models are much better at handling that. And second, the relationships are not necessarily linear. Uh, there are indeed um, uh, uh, various functional forms to these relationships that the machine learning models can pick up. So I'm showing here the model fit for New York for the AM period in the left, lunch period in the middle, and PM period on the right. Um, we usually do an 80 80-20 split in training the model and testing. So these uh, green columns uh, illustrate the training fit. Um, uh, we ended up choosing the random forest model for this case, uh, where, for instance, in the AM peak, the training fit um, is 95%. And then the uh, five-fold cross-validation on the 3% of the test data um, has an R squared or uh, row squared of 67%. 71% for lunch period and 73% or 74% for the evening peak period. Um, we also can compare this with linear models, which can do a pretty decent job um, on training, uh, but they don't, they do a much worse job on actually estimating uh, on test data that they haven't seen before. So the, the machine learning models tend to do a much better job actually um, uh, forecasting or, or uh, estimating on, on, on unseen data. They also break down uh, how what types of pedestrian flows then contribute uh, to uh, the different periods. So, for instance, in the AM peak period in the morning in New York, it's largely the types of trips that dominate are between metro stations and workplaces. At lunch, it's really between workplaces and uh, amenities, which include retailers, service providers, restaurants, and um, uh, entertainment facilities. Uh, and then in evening peak period, they're more balanced. No one tribe trip dominates as strongly as in the morning or lunch. And uh, we can also interpret this for the weekend models. Uh, here, I just show that indeed uh, some of the effects are nonlinear, uh, kind of illustrating why uh, using um, uh, some of the more advanced fitting models can be useful uh, because they can actually capture these nonlinear relationships in ways that regression models typically cannot. And once um, we have calibrated the model, uh, we then achieve a calibrated estimate for all streets in the data set. Uh, so just recall that it's calibrated on a thousand locations where the counts were available. But once the model is calibrated, it is used or usable on millions of street segments citywide, not just the thousand where the um, observed uh, calibration data was collected from. And these models that I show here on the screen represent our best estimate for pedestrian volume on every single sidewalk and crosswalk in the study area in the AM peak, during the lunch period, and on the right in the PNP period. We can zoom into some of these places and compare how the estimates compared to the actual counts on some of the segments where they were available. So the blue numbers here illustrate uh, actual counts and the white numbers on the yellow segments are estimates from the model um, that is being calibrated. So for instance, in this one particular segment, I don't know if you can see my mouse, the actual count was 1,577. Uh, the model estimate, uh, calibrated estimate is 1,338. It's not perfect, but it's in the right ballpark. Uh, uh, explaining um, uh, roughly the number of pedestrians. Um, and we can um, do this in multiple, well, we can check this in any parts of the city where pedestrian count data was available. Uh, and we can uh, just do a, a simple correlation between 
uh, predicted data um, uh, or predicted pedestrian volumes on the y axis and observed counts on the x axis during different periods. So on the upper charts here are weekdays, weekday morning peak on the left, weekday lunch in the middle, and weekday uh, evening period in the on the right. And on the bottom are weekend charts. In general, the model explains over 90% of all uh, variations in pedestrian counts uh, on individual crosswalks or segments where New York has collected them. Now, I want to finish up by showing why this can be useful um, and why cities should do this. Um, one of the things that a lot of cities currently worry about in the US in particular is traffic deaths or traffic injuries. Um, they've become totally out of control during COVID where there's an enormous spike. Uh, there was actually, uh, uh, in the US context, a large increase in vehicle miles traveled during COVID. Uh, people chose not to ride transit. Uh, even, tran even today, transit ridership numbers are still at about 75% of pre-COVID levels. They haven't recovered. And driving became more popular because you can isolate and be away from other people and people's work schedules became more flexible. So they tend to drive and, and do trips during the day as well. Uh, and traffic deaths went up. Uh, there is it was an enormous spike in especially pedestrian related traffic crashes during COVID. So cities uh, want to reduce that and there's a federal mandate to reduce that using um, vision zero uh, policies. Um, now, if I plot on this map on the left, uh, the 100 worst intersections in New York City in the time period from 2012 to 2023, that's 11 uh, year time period where we had the most numbers of pedestrians injured at intersections in New York, then there is a hot spot in Midtown Manhattan uh, where you see some intersections having uh, up to 27 pedestrian injuries on the same intersection in that 10 year period. And oftentimes cities would plot this data and try go and try to intervene on these high injury locations as the priority where to uh, do safer crossings and improve traffic safety for pedestrians. But this doesn't take into account the incidence rate, which would divide the number of injured pedestrians by the actual volume of pedestrians that cross the intersection. If we use the model data that I presented previously and divide through these pedestrian injury numbers with actual pedestrian volumes during the day, then the percent of pedestrians hit by vehicles shifts to a totally different area geographically. All of a sudden, the Bronx is actually more dangerous than Midtown Manhattan. Yes, Midtown, Midtown Manhattan has a lot of traffic crashes, but it has astronomical pedestrian volumes in places like Times Square. In Bronx, on the other hand, there's still a lot of traffic crashes, but far fewer pedestrians than in Midtown. And therefore, the percentage rate of getting hit by a vehicle is far worse in some of these outer boroughs. The same kind of analysis as for uh, Vision Zero and traffic crashes extends to other environmental hazards. We've done this sort of model for urban heat exposure and analyzed where is it both extremely hot and where do we have high pedestrian volumes getting exposed to the heat. Same can be said about air pollution, uh, the kind of thing uh, Aga shared um, just previously. Uh, this pedestrian volume data can provide a valuable denominator for much of this. But lastly, um, uh, from an urban planning and urban design perspective, um, another important example, and perhaps one of the most powerful examples of using a pedestrian volume model has to do with what we call pedestrian impact assessment. How do individual projects that get permitted and get built in the city, like new real estate developments, new apartment buildings, new office buildings, or even infrastructure changes at the street level, how do each of them affect pedestrian activity surround, in their surrounding areas? We can um, use the kind of model I showed to test that. Typically, traditionally, cities do environmental review for large projects. Um, uh, if In the US context, if a project is larger than 50,000 square feet, uh, it usually has to do an environmental review. An important part of the environmental review is traffic impact assessment, a study of how the proposed project would put more vehicles on city streets. 
And if the vehicle levels that are estimated on city streets resulting from the project are too high, then typically the developer has to pay for mitigation measures like signal readjustments to ease the traffic flow, like road widening, like parking provisions, like additional turning lanes and so forth. So if you really think about it, it's a rather perverse notion of environmental review. In the name of the environment, project impact assessments end up resulting in requirements to build more space for vehicles, which are the number one source of CO2 in cities. So we've tried to do something similar for pedestrians instead, pedestrian impact reviews to or assessments to see how a proposed project in any location will contribute to pedestrian flows and pedestrian trips around them. And that could lead to entirely different mitigation measures, safer crossings, better or wider sidewalks, public space investments, crossings that serve any age, gender, or ability level. Um, this is one particular example of applying the sort of impact assessment methodology to a very small kind of um, illustration on Broadway. New York City is currently actually considering turning much of Broadway into a pedestrian only zone, um, a, a kind of a, a car free street. It already did it on small sections. Now it wants to extend it all the way down. Um, and we estimated with our uh, flow model uh, uh, what this could do just in terms of changing the people's perception of travel costs um, uh, where uh, before the intervention you're walking on a sidewalk afterwards you're walking on a street and then estimated that basically uh, the pedestrianization of Broadway would increase pedestrian uh, volumes about 60 percent 40 to 60 percent uh, in this section of Manhattan uh, just by kind of that traffic calming strategy and and um, opening the street up for for uh, pedestrians uh, this is what a 60% increase in pedestrian volumes would look like on the street. This is existing, and this would be about 60% additional pedestrians on the street. Um, ultimately, uh, we are trying to work out a kind of a browser-based system where uh, we have a calibrated pedestrian flow model for a city like New York, uh, all pre-calibrated and uploaded, and that the users would be able to go into this model and open up the properties of different land parcels uh, and test scenarios, overwrite the properties of parcels, for instance, uh, study how a conversion of a residential building into a high rise office building, or maybe just an increase in residence on a site or putting on a new um, retail market on a particular location, or even the reconfiguration of street properties, widening sidewalks or uh, doing traffic calming would impact pedestrian flows. And all of this could be done or the backend system by uh, sort of inputting the changes and then com recomputing the pedestrian um, uh, trips uh, for the area from that. So with that, I just want to conclude that uh, all of this work uh, is in much in line, sort of like Aga was already um, uh, emphasizing that throughout the 20th century, we've really built both data and infrastructure to ensure car dependency. And I'm concerned, frankly, that the work happening on EVs and AVs is just another step to ensure that car dependency can continue. So in our group, we've tried to work very hard to make sure that we develop data and urban planning um, knowledge and sort of findings from research in ways that really inform how we can build a city that is multimodal where we're not about not about to eradicate the car, but get rid of the overwhelming dominance of the car and give equal priority to other modes of mobility like walking, cycling, and particularly public transit use across neighborhoods. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anders. Um, I think we'll open the floor for a couple of questions. Thank you, Anders. Um, Jaakko Lohinen here. So um, I was once listening to some interview of some pop star in Estonia. He was a very positive person, said that he only walks on the sunny side of the street, which brings me to the question of, about the sun, the heat you mentioned. But um, I can imagine that uh, during the day, in the morning, in the evening, the lunchtime, whatever, the, the sun light, especially in yeah. northern latitudes 
makes a right. lot of difference. Have you tried to model in the sunlight in the sense is it are you on the sunny side on the on the shady side is the sun facing you or from back of you because this kind of probably enables a lot of data science questions uh, um, on top of the models that you have built now yeah no it's a great question uh uh it it is a kind of an entertaining fact that if you walk down the champs elysees in, in paris uh from the triumph arch towards the louvre uh, the uh, northern side of the street, which gets southern sunlight, uh, has distinctly higher retail rents than the uh, southern side of the street, which gets northern exposure. Um, and so your point is well, well taken. It, in, in fact, is reflected in urban real estate prices oftentimes because that's where people like to walk. Um, in the northern hemisphere, uh, people generally prefer the sun, um, and but increasingly around the world, the opposite is the problem. People um, are getting too much of it, um, and in cities that are closer to the equator or in hot climates, uh, generally, uh, urban heat is a veritable problem uh, for getting people out on foot. In fact, we've done um, a couple of papers recently on estimating how uh, uh, heat waves affect people's willingness to walk. Uh, and found that there is a significant effect, and even the route choice preferences will shift during heat waves. Now, technically, methodologically, how to do that, um, there are pretty interesting um, remote sensing models like uh, um, to calculate what is called uh, an urban, herbal, urban the um, universal uh, thermal comfort index, UTCI in short. Uh, this is an index that takes into account um, uh, uh, te air temperature, wind, uh, shade, uh, uh, radiation from other surfaces, and humidity. And it can be computed for every square meter of the city, uh, basically from a three-dimensional model of the city uh, and uh, remote sensing data about um, uh, near surface temperatures and included with wind directions and so forth. Um, and so we can best basically assign a kind of a thermal comfort level to every sidewalk or every crosswalk in a city. And if the empirical data is there, which is now really building up because there are a number of research groups doing these studies about how climate or thermal uh, comfort affects people's walking habits. Uh, if we know these empirical findings, we can incorporate into the routing models too and make sure that when we route people over networks, we can, just like we know that people are attracted to shop fronts, uh, for instance, or wider sidewalks, uh, they can be attracted to sunlight um, and in the routing model. And, and uh, the model would take that into account and, and just uh, gravitate more trips to where the environmental conditions are nicer. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, hi, Andres. This is Mojikan talking here. And thank you for your interesting talk. I have two questions, maybe a little bit um, about the detail and technical points of uh, your presentation. Uh, first, uh, how did you label the uh, trip type in your data set? Uh, did the people who were responsible in counting, they also uh, actually uh, take into account the trip type? And the second question is, have you considered uh, in your model, in your calibration uh, models, to uh, actually use or ingest the IoT data stream uh, if it is available, or do you see any use case or value in that for the authorities? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, first, the uh, kinds of trips that we put into the model are generally informed by travel surveys. Um, so when most cities conduct a form of a travel survey every five years or so, uh, where they ask people about their detailed daily diaries. Nowadays, we also have detailed GPS records of people's movements and can deduct travel diaries and um, trip types from there. So we know what kinds of trips are most likely to occur during different time periods, and that's usually what goes into the model um, as initial estimates. The validation from the um, actual observed counts we don't know what type of trip people are engaged in. All we know is just how many pedestrians were walking in each direction on a sidewalk or a crosswalk. Uh, so that's where we basically, so to speak, regress the estimates against the actual observed trip volume to calibrate them. Uh, but we don't know there, I mean, nobody's interviewing the pedestrians on the streets. Those are um, 
the types are informed by travel surveys um, uh, ex ante. Um, on the question of IOTs, uh, yes, I, I think it, it's great to see new technology in, in uh, documenting what happens on the sidewalk. Uh, oftentimes we don't know very much about it. Um, Melbourne, Australia uses infrared counters. Uh, some cities have tried to use some form of Bluetooth or Wi-Fi counting. Uh, I found them to be somewhat less reliable. I, I, I like technologies that are directly observing either heat bodies or um, using computer vision to detect pedestrians. Uh, but I think there's a lot of innovation in this space, trying to sense what happens on the street um, and maybe even segment them into different characteristics of street users, like people walking with strollers or jogging or talking to each other and so forth, which uh, the more we know about those, the more we can also explain how the built environment uh, affects them. All right, thanks. So, so we'll add one question. And uh, Thank you for the presentation, firstly. Uh, maybe you already answered uh, my question, uh, but uh, I was wondering uh, how to distinguish uh, bias in your data, considering that uh, people oftentimes uh, use applications like Google Maps and uh, uh, the algorithm basically chooses the route uh, for the uh, person. Uh, and based on that, uh, have you considered uh, sharing your insights with uh, companies like uh, Google? Thank you. The model that I showed is really calibrated based on uh, actual pedestrian counts uh, from city streets in New York, uh, from in this case, from a thousand locations. So, um, I don't personally think that. Uh, I mean, I think most of the people we're observing are, are routine users uh, that go to work every day, etc. They're probably not trying to navigate on Google Maps in areas that have more tourists. Uh, their route choices may be affected by um, navigation apps, like, I don't know, maybe Midtown Manhattan or where a lot of hotels are located and people are unfamiliar with the New York environment. Um, um, but generally, I mean, even Google gives you a number of different alternatives. You end up choosing one of them. Usually you get three alternatives from the API. And um, we, you know, they try to estimate through their algorithms what are reasonable three alternatives for a pedestrian to walk. I think what happens in our routing model is actually quite similar. Um, we, we, based on route characteristics, estimate uh, what are the most likely routes. And we don't do three of them. We actually usually find uh, a lot more alternatives and each one gets uh, a fraction of the probability. So there may be even a hundred or thousand different alternative routes for a trip. Uh, each one gets a unique probability based on its characteristics um, along the way. Um, can you remind me that what was the second part of the question that I um, is I'm lacking yeah, right now? I just wondered if you, if you have uh, shared your insights with uh, uh, right. companies like Google. Yeah. Um, well, not necessarily. So that the volume estimates are not widely known yet. Um, we this is probably going to be the first citywide model um, in the world for segment level or sidewalk level pedestrian volumes in New York. So we're eager to see what applications come out of it and what interest there is around it. The New York City uh, Department of Transport and Department of City Planning, who we work with, have their own interests around this. Um, there's some related work that is not I didn't talk about today, but um, work on actually documenting sidewalk networks. That's certainly an area where Google has a lot of interest. Uh, uh, they do they have an in-house team in Google Maps who maps sidewalks in select cities. Um, unfortunately, like all big companies, they guard the data and do not release it to the public. And so what we've been trying to do is um, make it all public. So if Google uses it, uh, we're okay with that, just like anybody else. And it can end up in um, open street maps as well. All right. Thank you very much, Andres. Uh, and thank you so much for, uh, for uh, joining us and uh, as a speaker, and I wish you good luck on your business trip. So to move forward, um, so just as a reminder, so on the 24th of January. Oh, yes, please. Um, so to, to remind everybody, 24th of January, so the next uh, data science seminar, and it will be moderated by Jan Aru. And uh, thank you so much for showing up. I hope that it was uh, enriching for you. 
And don't forget there is still snacks and moments for networking. Thank you.